from the city of Chicago, a city most recently known for its crime and violence. From this podcast, we will be sharing stories of redemption from individuals raised in the tough streets of Chicago and from around the country. Some of them were gang members, drug dealers, incarcerated, victims, and perpetrators of violence. Listen to my guests as they share their experiences, struggles, trauma, but also the strength, hope, faith, and perseverance these have developed in them to keep pushing and moving forward in life. Tune in to hear how their lives have gone from darkness to light and from wrong to strong. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Wrong to Strong Chicago. I'm your host. My name is Omar Calvillo. And tonight we got an exclusive uh, interview. Uh, tonight I have alongside me, I have David Ayala and his cousin Jimmy Soto. Uh, they got exonerated, I believe it was last December, uh, after serving over 42 years in prison. And uh, David was sharing with me a, a little while ago that this is the first time that they've done an a interview together. Uh, so it's a privilege and an honor uh, for me to have these brothers here. Uh, well, well, welcome to, to the podcast, brothers. Thank you. Omar. <clears throat> it's a pleasure being here with you, and uh, especially with my cousin here. Uh, together, like you said, the first interview that we did together. And uh, we're, 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 we're praying for your success in your podcast. We believe your message is, is an important one, and that's why we're here tonight. Thanks for that. Thanks for the support. Uh, and I know, yeah, like, man, like your story, we we're talking a little while ago, how, man, that's, it went over like 20,000 views on YouTube. And man, it just, you know, it drew others in. And I know I interviewed Jimmy, so hopefully I'll be able to release it soon, you know. I'm waiting for the green light from him, so. No, we, uh, we're so. De you're definitely going to have the green light yeah. because uh, what we're going to say, I think, is important. What you do is important. And I'm, I'm, I'm the one that's humbled and honored to be here because, you know, you really showcase transformation, change of, in individuals. And I think that people need to understand that what pe someone might have done in their teens, you can't have that carry on when they're in, the, in adulthood. You know, uh, I think we talked about this last time there in scripture. It says when you were a child, you act like a child, you did childish thing. But now when you're an adult, you're expected to act a certain way. And so, you know, there is transformation. Even though we didn't do the crimes we were con convicted of, we still went through transformation ourselves. Hmm. Thanks for uh, sharing that, brother. Now, I know like uh, this came like last minute, you know, just over the weekend. I had actually invited these brothers. I'm going to have a little gathering uh, in uh, October. Uh, I'm going to try to get as many guests that have been on the on the podcast together and just to, you know, give them a thank you, you know, for sharing their story with us. Uh, like you mentioned, uh, what we're trying to do here is... Uh, uh, share these stories, not not maybe not to glorify the past, but to bring encouragement through those who that have been through similar struggles, and just to let them know that you know that, uh, that to keep hope, you know, and that change is possible and uh, freedom is possible, you know. So, uh, you know, let, let, let me ask you guys, whoever wants to go first, how has the transition been for you guys? You know, since since you've been out, I, I know I know you mentioned a little bit about it, but maybe give us an update, maybe of what's been going on in these last you know few months. Well, so <clears throat> since since we did the podcast which was uh, yeah. when I was uh, just released. And, you know, you spoke on what my short-term goals were, my long-term goals. Yeah. And uh, one of the goals I mentioned was to get my own home. And I think I mentioned, uh, you know, have my little, uh, my little lawn, <laughs> chase the kids off. <laughs> I'll be the old yeah, guy chasing yeah. the kids off. Yeah, so, you know, I uh, accomplished that goal. And uh, that's been my focus, putting my home together in the comfort level that I like, uh, just just comfort, you know. Um, and Domestic life is, is, it works for me and, and it's been pretty good. Um, I'm employed now, which is another blessing. And, uh, you know, at, at the state took so much decades of our, so many decades of our, of our life. We should be retired by now at this, at this age. But because this, the state stole our, our, our years of our lives, we're, we're now getting in, you know, for me, getting in the workforce and um, dealing with all the responsibilities of a, of a homeowner. And it gives me appreciation for other homeowners. So, you know, when I, when I go down the street, my eye, now my eye is to see, oh, that guy has uh, perennials and it looks like perennial flowers there. And, I, and, I'm, and I'm learning these things and I'm liking these things. And for my cousin, he has a, he has a definite path, what he's doing, a progressive path to help others that are wrongfully convicted and left behind. You know, never forgetting the, the, the ones left behind, but I, he could he could speak on that uh, yeah, yeah. yeah, well, what I've been doing since I've been out, I've been working at the Northwestern uh, School of Law as a paralegal. I worked at the Eviston Northwestern campus as a uh, research assistant. 
and I work at the University of Chicago as a community justice practitioner and fellow at the Center for the Study of Race, Politics, and Culture. So, you know, academics was something that was made available to me while in there. Unfortunately, David wasn't able to have those opportunities because they try to put, like uh, I spoke about them trying to always put somebody in a niche and keeping them in that niche when, you know, he was uh, uh, definitely doing a lot of positive things in there. He was with the JCs with me. You know, he was doing things to help people out. He worked uh, up front in the visiting room and he would take time to look when people had their their kids there or when people had old elderly people to look out for them, make sure to get up the steps and everything, sit down and make sure they're OK. So this is the side that people don't understand that, you know, those decades that we spent in there, we try to do our best to do positive things. And like I said, unfortunately, they took him out of state and he wasn't able to have the same opportunities. But I really believe that if he was given these opportunities, he would have uh, excelled in academics as well. Um, that being said, uh, currently I'm going to be putting my early applications in uh, for law school and I'm hoping to get into Northwestern. If I don't, you know, uh, it's, it's whatever God leads me to, you know, whatever university I get in, that's the university I'm supposed to be in. Um, you and I, Omar, had a conversation last time and I know that uh, it hasn't been released yet, but hopefully that would be part one. And this will be part two. And um, we spoke about, you know, a purpose of being in there, you know, and my purpose was, you know, helping people with their legal problems. As Obviously, there's a, a ton of that in there. And, you know, I became proficient at it and um, helped get some people fully exonerated, et cetera. But it's not about the accolades. It's why I was there. You know, it, it, I had to come to terms with, you know, why am I in there? You know, for all these years, constantly not getting it. And then I told you. There was a purpose there to help others. It wasn't to, for me. It was for other people. So we're put in places like you, like you, Omar. You're put in this place, have this platform in order to put some messaging out there. You know, that's in a sense your purpose in part. You, you probably are going to go on to bigger and better things as well. You don't know where it's going to lead you. But one thing's for sure, the spirit's going to take you where you need to be. And you're going to be in that spot at the perfect time. Amen, amen. Th 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 thanks for sharing that. Now, now, Jimmy, with you, how, how has, I know you mentioned what you're doing, you know, what you're getting involved in, but how was like a uh, personal life, like transitioning, like well, maybe difficult. the last few years ago? It's been difficult for me, you know, to, you know, have uh, uh, my personal relationships, you know, they're, they uh, weren't what I wanted them to be. You know, you're trying to find your significant other. Uh, it's It's not easy because I've been, you know, without quote unquote, being with somebody in the physical space of another woman. And it's an unnatural thing where you're, you're put in these unnatural settings. And so there's all sorts of temptations, but you know, you just got to stay, stay strong. And so um, what I mean by that, it's a struggle, even within the fi family dynamic, you know, I live with my sister, but it's like, she knows me, but I, she was eight years old when I got in. So we're just getting to know each other as well. I think it's the same might be true with David. Uh, his family are, are getting to know him as well or getting to know him again because we were gone so long. We might have had visits. We were able to t communicate with them. But at the same time, it's not the same as being in that space on a regular basis. So that that's a struggle. I mean, let's be honest. Uh, these places grind you down. They're meant to destroy you. And what it does is that it makes you like uh, have despair. You know, you, you we have trauma. We came out yeah. with trauma you know, that, you know, we don't even realize the, how, the extent or the depth of this, of this trauma, you know, like you said, they stole all these years and they also stole a, a, a part of our psyche. And so our spiritual, I could say this, our spiritual self, you know, what that's within us, which has been able to give us the strength to carry on because the mental toll, you know, if we just had that alone, our, our, our mental uh, thing, I don't think, you know, we would have made it. So like <clears throat> for me, there's like um like a lot of surprises that uh, like he spoke about trauma, but you don't even realize the trauma because uh, my friends could tell you my closest friends were wandering around me. Uh, one night, you know, I saw the moon and I was just marveling at this beauty of this beautiful moon, <laughs> and it struck me that this is a gift that God gives it to us. It gives it to us every day, every every night. There's a moon given to us, and we, when we get this gift, and I don't know if everybody appreciates the magnitude of what this means, you know, it brought me to tears, you know, a lot, a lot of things, you know, just suddenly bring me to tears. And, you know, like, um, it's something that was surprising that, uh, I never see as a weakness. It's not a weakness. It's a, it's a human emotion. And that's, uh, that's what we are. We're humans. And something that, uh, like, uh, 
the week before uh, last, <clears throat> when we, my sister called me, I was in a restaurant and we were waiting. We'll take out a restaurant and she's like, come here, David, come here. It was raining that day. And she said, look, it's a rainbow. And uh, I hadn't seen a rainbow probably 40 years or whatever, you know. And then we seen the rainbow and I was like, man, that, that rainbow is marvelous. It's a marvelous thing. And I looked around and the people were just going about their business, not even taking the time to look at that rainbow. So these things that, uh, you know, when you're deprived of uh, seeing the moon and because you're, you go to cell, you're, you're locked up at say latest at nine o'clock. You're locked in that cell until breakfast time in the morning, six o'clock or five, whatever uh, that prison runs a breakfast line at. So you're not going to see the moon. You're not going to see the stars. And when you see them for me now, when I see them, you know, driving down the street and I see a, a sunset, you know, it touches me deeply. So that is, um, it's what we were deprived of, but now it's a blessing. It's a blessing to have that appreciation for these, for these things. There's uh, things that people out here like to take for granted. Like you mentioned that people are just going by the day, ah, another rainbow, another moon, like, but to use like it's significant. Yeah. I can't remember Omar, if I yeah. mentioned it to you, but, uh, it was the first time that I walked the dog. So my brother-in-law, Joe, he, uh, you know, my sister, they, they rescue dogs. They had two dogs. One is kind of feisty. That's my favorite dog. And uh, he said, Dude, let's take the dogs for a walk. We took the dog for a walk. I had one dog. He had the other dog. And as we're taking the dog for a walk, you know, I'm looking at the dog and, and I see the dog sniffing the ground. And I'm thinking to myself, what is this dog? I don't know what this dog's thinking about. And I see a pretty squirrel go, go by. And I was just thinking, man, this, this is like t- tremendous experience for me. I hadn't walked a dog for over 42 years. It's been over 42 years and I walk a dog and it just, it just touched me. These things touched me deeply, you know? Yeah. I mean, especially, I don't know. They're like, they say uh, uh, dogs are like man's best friend. There's something about them, man. I think they, they said even like when, uh, when you're like petting a dog, that something happens like physically, like in the <laughs> body, like it does something. But, uh, and I know you too. I know you were mentioning the moon and you mentioned you hadn't seen, I believe it was a sunrise, yeah. but we were talking. Yeah, you, 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 sunrise, you, yeah. do, do, do you want to share that? It's, that, the, that? it's the same type of ethereal uh, thing, ethereal thing that Dave's talks about that I seen the sun uh, rise. And to me, it was like, I hadn't seen it in 25 years because I was always in a cell that, you know, didn't have a sunrise there. So I seen sunsets, but uh, to see the sun rise, it's like, you know, it was really, really, cathartic to me and I got emotional too. I got it. And I, and I still do. I go up to the beach of uh, the lakefront. I go early in the morning and I love to be there to see the sunrise. And there's other people that are there, but to, to us, it's like a new experience because we have not been able to experience that. So it's like, it's they're beautiful, but it also has like this really deep emotional effect on us. I think, or maybe even a spiritual one to, to be honest, because you know, you're not able to, I was eating like a, 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 a peach the other day, a fresh peach. And I'm just looking at it, marveling at it, eating how, how good it tasted. You know, the, I mean, wow, we were talking about uh, watermelons, the same thing. A lot of this fresh fruit and stuff was taken out of the prisons and, and they were, you wouldn't get it that often. So to have it readily available, just those really simple things is like, wow, it's like so great and wonderful. You know, it's a blessing to have that and being able to enjoy it. And, and I, and I do, I savor every bite of that. So Omar, so, yeah, yeah. so I had became new to Facebook and the okay. reason why I was uh, <laughs> becoming new to Facebook, because everybody was asking me, the people that had, uh, I was trying to be careful who I, I'll get my number to. And, uh, the people were wondering what I was doing. So they said, the easiest way how to show everybody what you're doing, put it on Facebook, what you're doing. He makes fun of me, jokes a little bit. <laughs> oh, I put it on Facebook. But so, post it. You're still talking I, about it. Post it, post it. <laughs> I took a, a, a bath. This is the first bath that I had in 42 years. And so, you know, most people just take a shower. Well, that day, my you know, I was working. Yeah. I was exercising. Yeah. My whole shoulders were, everything was sore. And I said, I'm going to take a bath. <clears throat> so I took a bath. So I told my girl, take, take, a, take a picture of Facebook. I posted it. I took it down two days later. They're saying that is inappropriate. There's some things I wasn't uh, exposing myself or anything. Right. But uh, they say that's that's like a little bit too personal. But, you know, I'm traversing that world, too, to know what's appropriate, what's not appropriate. People yeah. scrutinize you. They want to see what color your clothes you're wearing. Yeah. If you happen to wear some color clothes, they're saying, oh, now you're back in this or whatever. Whatever your expectation, you're thinking negative, that's your thinking. That's not yeah. my thinking. So I'm, I'm secure. Whatever color I want to wear, it could be any color. If that happens to be some part of some group or whatever right. that group is, it's just a color choice that I make for that day. I, and, um, you know, I was speaking to my cousin here and I was telling him, you know, we have passed by some of these parks that were traditionally gang infested uh, neighborhoods. And now the developers come and they gentrify the area. 
And so now, you know, it's a whole different uh, demographic in that neighborhood, you know. And I'm not hating on the gent- uh, gent- gentrifiers to come through there or the developers either. Although, you know, they push out the, the people that have been living there forever. And property taxes go up and the people can't afford to live in that neighborhood. But it struck me, you know, I realized there's people that lost their lives, you know, Holding it, holding down that park, that little that little park right there. People have lost their lives, and the gent and the developers come in there and take over that whole area without firing one single shot. And next thing you know, those people that lost their lives, they lost their lives in vain because the, now there's someone else. Uh, you never own that park, so right. you're saying that's your park, that's our park. It ain't your park. It's not your park because you now you see that people have developed in that area, maybe even tear the park down, and so. It's just something that I wish the people out there that are involved in the gang life could realize, you know, like, um, you know, tragedies, tragedies happen. What about your family? Do you know the cost of a funeral? And, you know, you want to be involved in this life. You're taking a chance with your life. You end up de- dead. You're leaving your family with a financial burden. I don't think there's many people that plan for the funeral expenses in that lifestyle, right. you know, maybe as you get older, you start planning, you start thinking ahead. You want to, you want to make it uh, not a burden on your family. You know, I know some people to make funeral arrangements, but they're they're not involved in any kind of nefarious activity. They're just they're just good thinkers planning ahead. But uh, I, I know that uh, recently there was a couple of murders in Chicago, and um, I, I just I, I know they were raising some money. Uh, heard to third parties that were, you know this this family was struggling to pay the funeral costs, and I'm just thinking you know you're putting a burden on your family, bro. Tragedy all around. It's just it's a sad a sad thing, you know. Yeah, it, 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 you're right. It's not just like the the loss of life, but man, the financial hit that a lot of times families have to borrow money, and now they're getting in debt try, to try to be a blessing uh, in a sense, right? Like to yeah, go ahead. Um, to add to what David is saying that uh. You know, it's really, really deep. Um, my studies and my personal observation of everything that's going on uh, out here, it's like this. It's It goes back really to the earliest times in Mesoamerica where you see the colonizers, the Spaniards come in and they had you hate your fellow uh, indigenous person. Then they would have you hate yourself, hate the woman. And so years and years, and this is generational trauma. I mean, People may not know the history of the United States, but in the Southwest, they were hanging Mexicans. They were hanging Mexicans more than they were hanging black folks in Southwest uh, United States at around, you know, 18, 18, mid 1800s. And so, you know, there was that whole fight that they had there. It wasn't only about land. It was all about, you know, control. And they had signs that I remember when I went to El Paso, Texas as a kid, it said no uh, whites only. And they said, dogs allowed, no Indians or Mexicans in these restaurants, you know. And I'm, I'm saying that to say, like David said, you know, um, we are fight or people are fighting for uh, turf areas and this and that. And this is just uh, a reiteration of what happened centuries ago of this self-hate and hating uh, ourselves, our own community. Like right now, it's if for Mexicans, uh, the 16th of September is coming out. And I seen something that my my sister showed me that people are saying, let's have Mexican pride. And one of it was talking about, like, let's show these Venezuelans. And I, once again, it's that criminalization, that othering of the brown body that they're showing. OK, these guys are this the same thing they do with the Mexican, Puerto Rican or, uh-huh. you know, however they play us against each other. And when I say they I'm talking about the status quo, the power structure that really runs this country. And so if they can keep us, you know, in this uh, cycle of hate and violence, then they, they maintain control. And that's really what it's all about. But if you change that dynamic and you bring in, you know, a, a, a loving yourself, then it, it, cha- it changes. And that's all through, you know, spiritual uh, healing. And, and it's because so much hurts out there. It's time to heal. It's time to restore. You know, mm. it's time for that. That's what we need. Yeah. Yeah. Now, one thing I wanted to ask, I know it's probably off topic. But that came to my mind earlier. Um, how many um, men did you see in prison that it was father and son behind bars? Because I, I know I was only locked up for three years, but I got to see that like a couple where it was father and son. And I see. And the reason I bring that up is like the generational, almost like a generational curse, generational stronghold. Yeah. Uh, so that was just a question that, that came yeah, to my I'll answer that real quick. Yeah. I've seen a lot of it. You know, yeah. I'm sure David has too. But there was one in particular where you had the grandfather, you had the son, 
um, I mean, the, the father, and you had the son, and then you had uncles and nephews, just one family. You had all that, all the same last name locked up, you know? So, yeah, it's definitely generational. I yeah. saw that. <clears throat> I remember there was a father and son that had the same the same name. He was junior. And uh, this this guy was father and son. He was junior. The son was junior, and they lived in the same cell. And so when they would bring the mail, the officer would say their name. And so like, it was, it would, they didn't know which one was uh, the mail intended for. <laughs> but uh, I was thinking when I saw that, that, that father and son, like, um, you know, how would it be if I was ever in prison with my father? Which well, I don't think would have ever happened, you know, but, and I'm not judging those guys, you right. know, they may have been innocent men too, but uh, it just, it, it just struck me, it struck me the, how it would have affected the family, you know, how it would affect that particular family. Um, the, I won't say the primary breadwinners, but maybe they are, you know, because uh, women are just as uh, equal and qualified to, to bring uh, money home too, you know, they're just as qualified in yeah. many cases, more qualified, you know, some, some, I think we need more uh, uh, female leaders in, yeah. in the communities or yeah. in the political scene or something. I think that uh, maybe with some more women uh, taking the lead, there'll be less problems. That's how I feel about it. Okay. You know? no, and the reason I bring that up, cause I was thinking, I know you guys are talking about change and maybe changing the mindset mentality, like as men, like, cause I, I've, I've interviewed a few people where they were like, almost like bred to be gangbangers since they were little. Yeah. Like, and yeah. it came from the, like you mentioned, grandfather, father, uncles. And like, if you think about it, like it, it'll be easy to judge these, these young men, right. That say they go into that lifestyle to commit crime, but they were like basically raised like to be that. Like how, how, how can you like, in a, you know, like not judge them, but yeah, you know, like to judge them when, when they were raised. So how, how could we, I guess, break that? Like starting with, like families that are like almost um, like re reproducing that kind of lifestyle. Like as men, what, what, what could we begin to do to break if, that? If you truly yeah. love your, your child, if you truly love your, someone very close to you, you know that you do, you really don't want that for them. Now, if you're trying to build a dynasty, for instance, or something like that, and then you say, well, I'm going to put my blood relative because I know that blood relative has my back, but it's, it's really, uh, it's, you haven't evolved enough to know that you should always want something better. You should always something want something better for your child. And if you're leading them to a path that's inevitable for you to go to jail or or get killed or something like that, then you know what kind of love is that? But um, it, it's 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 it's. I look at that and then, uh, you know to be honest with you, I say that guy's a fool. That guy right there is a fool because if you really love your son or your child, your daughter, you wouldn't want that for for them. You know? I agree with David saying absolutely. You know, I mean if. You don't want to see your kids. Uh, you want the, every generation wants to see the next generation do better, and to have that, I, it, it's really their priorities are not in the right place. They probably have trauma themselves. You know that generational trauma we talked about, yeah. and this all this really is like I want you to be what I was. You know, uh, but there comes a point where, like you said, you got to break that cycle. And how do you do that? I mean, to me, to hit what the Old Testament says, it says if you teach the child the ways of the Lord. He'll always come back to it. Yeah. So if they're not getting these principles, this moral compass at a young age, then of course they're going to go to the streets. Of course they're going to go into look into that gang life to think that's what it is. But there's no longevity. I mean, you could really look. There's very few old timers that are in their fifties gang banging. You know, this isn't so. It's like you don't see no old drug dealers. You know, there might be a few. Don't get me wrong, but it's very rare because people grow out of that. This is something that you you mature and you realize, hey man, this ain't for me. You know, at yeah. some point, you yeah, I've seen it in prison. I've seen it out here. People aren't, aren't doing that, you know. But, you know, I, I firmly believe that if you te teach the, the child what's right and wrong or, or, or more a better path, they will. those principles will stay with them. Yeah. No, you, you bring up that scripture is uh, uh, train up a child in the way he should go. And when he's older, he shall not depart from it. Uh, there, there was a brother I interviewed here uh, that he said uh, uh, that scripture applies both ways because he said if you train up a child to be a killer, he's going to grow, grow up to be a killer because he said that his, his father would like beat the mom and pull, pull a gun on him and his brother when they were little. And he learned this. Behavior, uh, behavior, behavior, yes. Yeah. So then he grew up, and that eventually, when he was older, he he went down that right. path. So he said that scripture like applies both ways. Like you could train him up in the ways of God, but if you teach him to be a criminal, he's gonna he's gonna grow up to be a criminal. You know, so that's 
that that's pretty um, messed up in a sense, right? Like to, to break these patterns, yeah. the pattern for so many of us in our communities to to break the pattern to to leave that life. Uh, everybody has a have, has their own story of of how change came about in their life. I won't say there's a one fit for for everybody. But uh, I know there's some commonalities. The, the people, if you think about the people for where me and my cousin here come from, the people who didn't get involved in, in those sort of activities. And I think I mentioned this before. It's a parents that have a tight rein on their child. And, uh, you know, like, this is a mother who's going to be there in your face. Get you away from this. You're not going to be at that park. You might try to sneak out the window or something. It's not going to work for very long. And they'll just take you and expose you to some other things. You know, like in my personal life, I wasn't exposed to some of those things that would have took me away from uh, running around the neighborhood. And I think that probably if I, if I would have, I think I would have excelled in other, in other areas of my yeah. life, you know, but, uh, you know, if now the, it's for the parent, the guardian to, to identify how we could take this person here. You know, like, um, my father, he had a lot of, a lot of custom work done at the home and, uh, these carpenters or these ingenious carpenters would, would make nice things in the house and uh, I used to always watch them. And then uh, I think those guys used me because, like, they'll say, hey, hey, carry the tools here. You can carry our tools and watch his work. And I was watching them work, and they'll take something out of nothing and make a really beautiful thing here. And I think that uh, if, you know, I'm not uh, talking bad, degrading my father's parenting skills, but if uh, he would have harnessed my curiosity and my interest there, then put me in a, in a trade, uh, trade uh, vocational school. And I probably would have been uh, like Norm Abrams, or, uh, Master Carpenter or something <laughs> like that. So, you know... Uh, you have to take what what the the young child is uh, interested in yeah. and ha- harness that, and hopefully it'll go to something uh, positive and something uh, worthwhile, lucrative for the guy. Yeah. Because, you know, he can make a living at this. Okay. Do you want to follow up anything? Else? Well, yeah. I mean, you know, it's not only with a, 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 a lot of families that that traditional nuclear family father, mother. There, um, you know, a lot of families want to be single parents. But that's not always the case. Even if you have both parents, like David said, the child could go go to school or whatever way they can get out the house and go sneak off and hang out in the hood and wind up um, banging. Uh, so there's, there, on the one end, you have people that come from a solid family. And on the other hand, you have people coming from dysfunctional families. And so, you know, family is where it starts, to be honest, right? Uh, I mean, but, you know, ultimately the child gets old enough that they're going to make their own decisions. And um, I, I, we spoke about this a little bit last time that your brain doesn't develop until you're 25 years old. That's a, 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 a biological or a physiological fact. And so if your brain's not fully developed, how could you make these cognitive, you know, uh, informed decisions? You're making rash decisions. And, it, and if you look at really when crime happens, it happens from the age of 15 to 21 is the primary age when people are, are, are do a lot of, particularly when you see these gang banging or gang related uh, deaths, you know, that's when they happen. And um, unfortunately, you know, there's other factors that, that are also, there's the socioeconomic factors, you know, lack of employment, poor housing, you know, uh, lack of uh, investment in the communities, et cetera, and so forth, you know, lack of investment in public schools. So all these factors mix into a, a volatile formula, which, we see these cycles just continue because they people don't feel they have they have any way out. I've met uh, individuals in there that never left the Chicago area, or for that matter, left their area in in Chicago. They never left like they live on the south side. They never been to the west or the north side. You know, they just stay contained in their little area. Yeah, it's true. That's the we took recently. We uh, went on a boat ride. It, it was the um, historical boat ride, and you know these sometimes buildings or some of these buildings there. I always saw them. I always then went downtown. We saw these buildings. I never knew the history of the building. Oh, that was the Wrigley building right there. And this is what happened there. And it was interesting to me, but some people are stuck in their, in their, in their neighborhoods and they never, they never leave those neighborhoods. But it's just, um, like when I said, uh, you know, there's a lot of humble park. You have Pilsen. We call it 18th street all my life. And there's a lot of, a lot of changes happening there. And like I said before, you know, people that were gangbanging in those areas, you know, held down. They thought they were holding down the area. You don't hold that area down. You see the developers come in and move you out. Without firing one single shot, you lost something that you thought you were holding down. You, you never yeah. were. So this is just like somebody, you open your eyes and you see these things, you realize these things. And it's just interesting to me 
you know, the, the dynamic of, the, you know, like, for instance, the gangs, right? So, you know, you, you are, you, this is what you are. That's your identity. Your whole substance is that's, that's your identity. And all you know is that's what that guy is. So you just, you don't know that person uh, personally or anything like that. You just know this is my identity and that's his identity. And we're fighting. Why? Well, they can't even tell you. All you know is some guy got killed constantly and it's going back and forth. And you're not thinking about the tragedy, the harm you're doing. We have beautiful communities, very yeah. beautiful communities, but they're tainted by this activity going there. Recently, some young guy, he was a soccer player. He was going to be the captain of the team. And Little Village area got killed. Yeah. He was an innocent guy. This guy had nothing to do with anything. And he was in that area and uh, he was killed. So uh, just a tragedy all the way around. And when I see these things, I just shake my head and just say, wow, you know, this is, this is, this, this happens. And okay, so how does it stop? How can this possibly stop? You could do March. I went out of March. We went out yeah. of peace March. You know, okay, that's th for that night. <clears throat> what about tomorrow? You know, the, the people, within these groups that are advocating. You can advocate something better. You could advocate, let's stop this, you know? When I was when I was growing up, um, when I, I lived right on 26th Street, the commercial 26th Street. So like there wasn't anywhere near I could I can go to 31st Street to to Petrosky Park, Hewlett Park and get involved in some sports there. That's a walk, especially in the wintertime. So, you know, well we have what they say, uh, I don't this is the devil's workshop, you know. Now we're ha we're hanging around the street. You know what's easy in those neighborhoods? Getting some liquor, you know. And uh, whether the the liquor store guy won't sell it to you, we get a runner. Hey, yeah. We'll buy you, you. You're a damn bump. We'll give you a couple bucks, and you can go get us. And this guy has no scruples. <laughs> He'll go get us a young kid some drink. Yeah. We'll drink in Boone's Farm. Fucking <laughs> easy nights, stepping yeah. on all these uh, Boone's Farm uh, uh, bottles. Night train, <laughs> Wild that. Irish Rose, all the uh, white port and Kool Aid, bumpy face gin. But they, they have a Mad Dog uh, Twenty Twenty. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mad Dog Twenty Twenty. This okay, yeah. So and 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 our black communities, yeah. they have uh, desert uh, fruit deserts. You know, they don't have access to good fruits. We have diabetes in the, in those in those neighborhoods yeah. right there. Well, you can get cigarettes in that neighborhood. And you liquor. can get liquor in that neighborhood. You can you could get some condoms. You know, but what about the fruits? Yeah. You know, thank God for the for the mothers and the grandmothers who make their own garden. You know, yeah. they make their own garden, and then because uh, they're precluded, because you're going to have every other kind of store there, but uh, a fruit store or a health store. And then, and then, what happens when uh, the poor community uh, businessman, small businessman, builds? I saw the thing, and um, it was unfortunate. He built a electronics uh, business in in the, in the neighborhood. And somebody took the, the vehicle and smashed into the building. I kept smashing into there and robbed all his stuff. And it's like the second robbery he had there. And uh, he did an interview on the news. He said, look, I'm trying to, I'm trying to provide a service for the community that yeah. never was there. And what happens? They take the vehicle and smash it in there. And when I saw this, I was just thinking to myself, I know when me and my cousin here will drive down the street, we will get stopped for, for no probable cause. They stop us. <laughs> they stop us, search our car put us on there and in the summertime search of tear the car up and all this stuff. Yeah. And uh, where are they now? And, and I'm not speaking uh, against the police officers. They have a job. They have a, a great uh, job to do, but uh, where were they when they're smashing this car back and forth? Yeah. Where were they when the taco truck guy that got robbed three times? He's just trying to serve some food for the community. He's a small businessman trying to make it provide for his family. And, uh, and this crime is just very unfortunate. And uh, when I was in Cook County jail, you know, be, they, they isolated me. After like four days, they isolated me. When two days, so many guys talked about Jimmy. Jimmy Soto did this. He's a great guy. I said, you can't tell me nothing more than what I know about my cousin. Of course he's a great guy. <laughs> but he helped so many guys get back in court. And uh, But when I saw these young guys in, in the county, I would ask them, hey, so what, what are you doing with your case? And it was like I was speaking Greek to them. They didn't understand anything. I said, look, you guys are worried about commissary and you're worried about who's going to take your phone call and you're worried about who's going out with your girlfriend, but you're not understanding what's going to happen with your, with your case. You're not, you're not asking the right questions. And before you know it, you're going to, you're going to forfeit your, your rights that, that, that you have available at this time, because there's timelines and deadlines. He can speak. Yeah, and I, actually, I was, I was listening to, to your podcast, like during the week. And then you were talking about, I think it was uh, after three and a half years, 
there was like a like a deadline for something for a PU well, or post for, post conviction yeah. post conviction post conviction. There's timelines and everything. And like he's right, but if you don't preserve those rights at the trial level or or post right there, like once you're convicted, you waive a lot of that, and then you know you can never litigate it, and you're precluded. And yeah, you can blame it on your lawyer, but it's a hard fight. It then becomes the fight, you know. So yeah, uh, he's he, he told him right. I mean. I've seen so many people in there thinking that there's going to be this magical change uh, with the law. I haven't seen a change. Truth and sentencing been on the book since 99, you know, so um, I'm currently trying to change that. I'm working in, in some movements. Uh, one is building communities, not prisons, but you know, I'm just, it's like a little drop in this big ocean. I'm not making too many waves. Uh, I'm trying to get them to do it, but uh it's going to be, it's going to take everybody getting together and, and instead of, like he said, fighting each other and then maybe possibly winding up in prison or they got homies in prisons, you know, and if you really care about that individual, you want to see him come back out or her come back out. Yeah. And, you know, they're not going to change um, these laws unless we demand it. And we got to just, you know, coalition build. And like he said, they're taking over our neighborhoods. They're de investing in these neighborhoods. You have this whole um, immigrant Venezuelan problem, you know? And so what are we going to do? What are we going to do that we've been in the city or those that have been in the city for so long, you know, when is enough is enough? When are we going to say we need to start changing? And well, yes, we have to change our mindset and what we're doing, but we have to get the power structure to change too, you know, to change these laws, give these individuals pathways for release. Because if we didn't, if we didn't come out the way we did, we were going to die in prison. As simple as that, you know. Yeah, you, you know what? I, I know you guys mentioned about like the advice you're giving. Because I, I, I go into Cook County like on uh, Mondays, and I, I go like to 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 witness to, right. to these guys. You know, do a Bible study with them. Uh, but I know you mentioned certain things that they should be doing while they're in there. You you want to mention maybe some of, some of those things that come to 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 mind? Because like you said, they're worrying about the wrong things when they should be focused maybe on some important things that could help them in the the long run or. Well, they have to understand that they have to understand like their next court date. What does that consist of? What are, what are we doing here? What is what is my lawyer doing? Uh, are they are they doing the investigative work to see the witnesses that are available now because they may not be in the future? And you have, like you said, you have a, a deadline on a, your post conviction if uh, past your conviction, and uh, your focus is on other things. Uh, and then next, you know. Uh, the whole legal world passes you, tramples over you, and runs you over, and now you're just a victim of uh, of the of the system, the criminal yeah. system, you know, judicial system. But uh, what I would recommend for those guys to do is, um, yeah, well, they don't feed you good in Cook County Jail. Mm-hmm. I just left Cook County Jail in December, and Cook County Jail for breakfast <laughs> you get a peanut butter sandwich, and every two weeks you get two two boiled eggs, but it doesn't deviate from there. And every lunch, you get a bologna sandwich. So you're getting one sandwich for, for breakfast, and you're getting a sandwich for lunch. And so then the commissary prices are just so incredibly high. And you get a regular uh, dinner. A friend of ours, Robert, he, he posted a picture on his Facebook, a tray. And he says, I'm, hum- I'm humble now with the blessings I have because this is what I used to eat. And I ate this for years. And, and, and it's true. Some of that stuff we call a mystery meat. We don't even know what, we don't know what that was, you know? <laughs> It was like um, some people say, I want to feed that to my dog. Well, I like I like dogs, so I definitely wouldn't feed that to the dog. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. But uh, it was just so I would tell my advice to those guys over there. Quit tripping about who runs this phone. You know, who, you know, share that damn phone. Or, you know, don't worry about uh, insignificant things that aren't going to help you get gain your freedom, acquire your freedom, get, you know, get your freedom. And so, you know, think about something better. But, um, you know, like right now, you know, like I said, I sometimes watch the news very depressing to me to see, you know, another, it's always the same. Some little girl got shot, some guy got shot, some little innocent person got shot. And um, I know, you know, shortly after we got released, you know, I uh, I had the pleasure of meeting uh, somebody who was, you know, uh, at one part of my life, he would, we would consider him a rival, you know, and he was a, a, it's of my generation. And then we, we sat down, we met, and, and I was somebody else that was there said, let's take a picture. I said, yeah, let's take a picture, man. Come here. And he's like, you know, I'm concerned, you know, some people might take offense to the picture. I said, no, you're wrong. You are wrong. This is the picture we're supposed to take. Yeah. This is the picture that we should put out there. We should put this wherever people could see to say, this guy 
has credentials and credibility in that world at one point in time. That guy that I was with. And they and them, who knows, maybe some could say the thing about same thing about me. And then they say, if this guy can do that and that guy can do it, and these guys were not just some just anybody guys. This was somebody here yeah. and um they can do it, then this should be an example for others to do too. You know? Yeah. That's your brother you why are you fighting your brothers? Why are you yeah. fighting your brothers? You know, for your identity purposes, you need to stop that, you know? Uh, you, you know what, I, if I go back uh, during your interview, you mentioned about when you were, I believe it was in Tams or wh where you were at and just sharing, I think maybe a noodle or a cup of coffee or something. And you mentioned that it was maybe like uh, somebody, let's say on the, on the other side, right? Like a rival, whatever you want to call it. And they start looking out for each other like, man, like yeah, the, the, these are the guys that begin to, 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 to look out for you no matter where, right. where you're at. Right. You know what happens? Yeah. So they say, man. They, the state, they took us and they put us in a prison five hours away or six hours, however far Menard is. That's a, that's a drive right there. And say, you know, my family, you know, uh, my girlfriend, she don't want to come together. Hey, bro, you know, you're, you, you're close to us. We're, we're, we're from the same community. We're just a little bit apart. And, you know, can we carpool? And, you know, how many times I've seen over the years, guys that were fighting each other, uh, you're serving time for murder for that guy's group and, and vice versa. And next thing you know, after a certain period of time, you find out that you actually have a need uh, that the other one can help you out with. And um, now your girls are carpooling. And now you, it's like, wow. You know, like, uh, so all those young guys that are doing this thing at some point in their life, if they ever come to prison, they're going to come to the realization because it's such a close environment that, you know, that dude's not a bad guy. Right. This dude, this dude's cool. He's like me. We're just flying different colors, and we're from different areas and different organizations. But uh, actually, the, it's the same interest, the same sense of humor. You have the same sense of humor. You like the same music, you know? Right, exactly. And it, it's, it's, it's just something that some people, it takes a while for them to, to understand it. Yeah. Oh, well, what I would tell those individuals that you go into county jail with is, like you said, to get like, the discovery material early on. A lot of uh, public defenders, and this is not no shade on them, they'll tell them they can't have it when, in fact, that's not true. They're able to at least view it. They need to go through that. And really, if they have to have several visits, the lawyer got to let you look at everything that the state got against you, the prosecution got against you. And then you can mount some type of attack against that. You know, like he said, investigative work, et cetera. You know, um, another thing that they need to realize is that, you know, when they come, when they come to prison, like he said, um, we're not like. Uh, the western part of the United States prisons where they separate rival groups. They won't put Norteños and Sureños together over there and, and et cetera. Whereas here, you're going to be likely, they put you in the cell with somebody, what they call ops, your opposition. You're going to go in there with somebody who you thought was your op. They do that on purpose. Uh, and that's the way IDOC does it because they feel like, okay, we're not going to have them together in the same group because they're going to start plotting. So they, that's how they do it. So that's one thing. The second thing is you're going to be with somebody almost like 23 hours a day minimum uh, if you're not on lockdown. You know, you're going to have to smell his feces. You're going to have to put up with his, with his ways. He's going to have to put up yours. You know, vi visits may not come through. The phone's going to be, you're not going to get that much phone access. You know, so it's not going to be what you think it's going to be. Uh, it's like you said, lousy food. You're going to have to rely on commissary. A lot of times they don't have the items on commissary. You know, a lot of times you're not going to have money because people are going to start as you as you're in there more years. People are going to stop sending you stuff. So your homies that you think are going to be there, they're going to fade away, too. You're not they're not going to be looking out for you. They're not going to get your lawyer. You know, why aren't they getting on your lawyer now? You know, so this is the point. They really need to look at. Uh, and what is really going on with their life, you know, and it takes a while. It takes a while. And that goes back to that maturity that I told you about. It takes a while for it to set in. But they're going to realize real quickly that, you know, everything that they've been fighting for, this whole belief system that they had or this political identity or social identity, it's all been a farce. Yeah. You know, it, so, it, it, like it, I said, it, we have more in common. It, the idioms are more are, are the same. Yeah. And, and it's like a lot of the guys that I see are young, man, 18, 19, in their 20s. And it's, 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 it's sad to see, you know, that they're like in the beginning of it. And a lot of them are fighting like some serious stuff, you know, so. These guys, is, yeah. you know, so, you know, I don't know, like I said before, if it's, you know, we're, we're people of warriors. You know, we have warrior blood and boiling inside of us, you know. So we see the guy, our warrior mentality takes over something. But, 
you know, when I was in Cook County Jail, I see some young guys, and they look strange to me. They even had strange haircuts from what I'm used to. <laughs> this guy looks silly, you know what I mean? I looked like he was in the Amazon jungle, <laughs> but uh, he didn't have a barber to cut his hair. Yeah, they, 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 got, they, they colored the Edgar, they looked yeah. like uh, Incas. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Trying, trying to offend yeah. anybody. No, no, right, right. Hey, hey, that's how I, I view right. them. And, uh, you know, uh, I'm sure you guys probably had afros back in the days. Yeah. Right? No, no, no. Man, we have no, no. Back. You push back. <laughs> yeah, hey, you know, but, um, so, like, uh, and I see the, uh, before, like I said, they isolated me right away. They even told me, you you slipped through the system. You were supposed to be isolated. Why you stigmatize me so much? I've been gone. I've been in other states. Talk to those uh, officers over there and tell them what I was doing over there in that state. Mind my own business. Stay in my lane. You know what I mean? I could do time better by myself without worrying about somebody else's problem. I could. I, I, I I'm not gonna. You know, I could solve my own problem. I don't have them. And so when I see these young guys, little macho guys, you know, one guy put the radio up when I talk. So can you lower it? I'm getting on the phone, putting it up louder. Come here, I'm gonna talk to you over here. And so you don't understand this, I'm gonna talk to you in another kind of way. I'll send you something different, you know. But so like there was the macho thing all of a sudden now. But um it's just uh they need to change the mentality on, on some of these things, you know? And I think for that they need like um different le- leadership, I guess. Because mentoring also, or mentoring. Yeah, yeah, there you go. Now, they, 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 that's a big word, you know that I think that's the word that I had I never grew up like hearing about a mentor, man. What, what, what's the importance of having a mentor, especially one that's going to show me in, in the right way, I guess. Well, David spoke about me helping some guys with the legal work, but when I take on a case and I didn't want to take, I couldn't help everyone. You know, you, you are, I am mentoring a lot of those young guys that come to me, you know, and, uh, I told you the crazy thing is I wouldn't be charging these guys. So I was just doing it to refine my skills to, to, to help me with my case. But the point is that, uh, I, I mentored a lot of guys in there. A lot of them, I, I guided them towards um, towards education or programming or, you know, and telling them the realities of like, like I mentioned about, you know, how they, this is just a generational thing. And they taught us to, you know, uh, 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 hate ourselves and hate others. I mean, I, I don't hate myself. I don't think anyone will say they hate themselves. What I mean by w- when I say that they hate themselves to say that, the white skin, the lighter skin is better than any other skin, the brown skin or the black skin. So there's that uh, skin construction, that construct that your skin color identifies who you are and makes you less than the people that are in power. And so that is, like I said, that's that generational thing to say that you're not as worthy or you're not the same as, as someone with a lighter skin co- construction. When that's a, Again, that's a lie, but we're taught that and we and it goes to generations because I I look at it now, I'm, I go to a lot of academic settings and I'm able to hold my own and I see a lot of people there that can do it as well, people, w- w- people of color. But the point is that, you know, like I said, it's this, uh, this thing, this warrior mentality, this thing that comes out all the time. And, uh, you know, it, uh, it's something that's in us and it's something that has, you could, you could, you can, uh, uh, deescalate it. You can get it out of you. You don't have to all the time be confrontational. It's not easy to do, but the mentoring comes in there. And that's what I would do. I'm like, man, you don't have to do that. Like, like he talks about the respect. You got to show respect in order to get it. If I'm not respecting, you know, the noise level that I got, like there's still black radios in there, these boom boxes that guys will play. And, you know, like he said, it could be annoying. They could play music that you may not like, but they think by turning it up all the way that everybody's enjoying. No, everybody's not enjoying. I'm doing schoolwork, you know? Yeah. So I would talk to them and tell them, you know, Hey, listen, man, you want people to respect you. You want to get the phone. You think people are playing you for the phone. You're not going to get any respect by not respecting others. So it's these little life lessons that, you know, you have to give to the younger generation. At that time, at that time, I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to be tolerant about anything. You know, <laughs> I'm just going to be honest with you. I'm not going to be, I'm going to tell you the truth. I'm not going to, I'm not going to have a tolerance level. I'm not saying I have a short fuse or something like that, but if you can't understand this language, then let's talk this other language. But that's right now. This we don't need this stuff on the streets because this is like. A, when I got out of Omar, I seen some news stories, and or I even talked to some guys. I ran this couple guys I hadn't seen for a while, or he said, "You know that guy got shot ten times. He's still walking around. Damn, that guy got shot ten times. Wow, these guys must be the people who are doing the shooting must be going to the gun range, and they must be really honing in on their skills. And then I found out, no, it's not that. They have these long clips." Right. The accessibility of these firearms in these neighborhoods is a big cause for this happening because um, you can you can I don't know. I'm not in that lifestyle, but I'm pretty sure you can uh, get some money and buy a most lethal uh, firearm and uh, one with a long clip. And then uh, you, you could you could be 
Jose Feliciano. You could be a Ray Charles. You could be a blind guy, and you got this long yeah. clip, and you're gonna shoot. You're gonna shoot that street up. You're gonna shoot somebody ten times. Yeah. Now you're not a good shot. You're not a marksman, a sharpshooter, <laughs> or expert of uh, firearms uh, person. You're just somebody who has a long, uh, large capacity clip, and that's yeah. why you're shooting these people. And this is why the accessibility of these farms in these neighborhoods is what's causing this tragedies and this destruction in our neighborhood, in our community. You know, that's something that I, I didn't see back then, like in the 90s, but you're right. Like, uh, I know the, um had to be a month, month and a half ago, I believe, there was a, a sheriff that got uh, killed at a gas station. It was uh, like a carjacking, and they said they shot over 70 times yeah. at him with, with an extended clip, and like, man, that's something that Back then, I don't know. I, I never heard like as common, I guess, as as and now. I'll tell like you, it. I'll tell you, Omar. So, like I told you, like uh, me learning about the Facebook world, right? And uh, I'm getting away from that too. But uh, these guys, they're they're uh, my cousin could tell you, they're 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 ignorant. You know, they're stupid guys. They're taking a uh, they're taking a video and they're showing the guns they got and yeah. they're doing all the kind of uh, gang representation symbols. That is going to be People's Exhibit A. People's Exhibit A in front of a jury when you go to trial because you're going to get pinched sooner or later and they're going to put those images on and, and big screen in the jury and the jury's going to see that and you're going to go to prison. And you're going to say, why did I even take such a foolish thing? It's a stupid thing to do. You know. There, there, there was a guy here. Uh, um, he was doing our videos, uh, 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 Love City. So he he does like videos for, uh, you know, for, for people, you know, for cheap. And that's that's his way to reach the youth. And uh, he tells him that he don't he ain't gonna do no videos with guns in the videos, and he's like, man, I'm looking out for you because some some people wanted to do that, you know, like throw their guns in the video and stuff. But he told him, man, they're gonna use that against you, like in a fair case. I forget what what he called it, but he said, let's say you get charged with something else, they they could grab these pictures and like add time to your sentence. So I forget yeah. what um extend the sentence. Yeah, so, and there was a word he used that uh like um circumstance something that. Even though it's not part of the case, the judge could look at those pictures and videos, right. and because of this, like give you more time because you're already. Is it wasn't like a one time thing? Like your whole lifestyle was about this violence right. and. So you know, I believe in the Second Amendment. I believe in the, your right to bear arms. You know, there's been cases where somebody wants to shoot up the shopping center, and somebody uh, uh, carry concealed will take yeah. down the the shooter. And so I believe in the, uh, the right to bear arms. I don't believe the, the right to go shoot somebody or something like that because you want to go, you know, act like a fool or something. But uh, it's just, you know, like I said, you know, these things that we talk about, we're not saying them because all of a sudden we lost our heart. We lost, uh, we're soft guys. I'm not a soft guy, you know, but, you know, some things, like I said, you know, I see the moon, it touches me a certain kind of way. That don't make me soft. That makes me a human being. But uh, I just, I, you know, I just wish that uh, other people would have a, uh, you know, more rational heads and their thinking, you know, and realize, you know, you're, you're wasting your life with this fighting your own brothers. You yeah. Are, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And, and to the point that he's talking about that, you know, NRA, they make, there's like a billion dollar a year industry with firearms. I, I agree that these um, extended clips, these switches, et cetera, the accessibility of these, um, uh, short assault rifles are making it for a really, really uh, bad mix where individuals getting their hands on it. You know, I, there has to be some type of control on that because it's just getting crazier and crazier because it's so easy to get, you know, that you see it all the time. So, yeah. you know, um, we again had to have our lawmakers or something, something got to be done to, you know, have it work. Cause they, they say now, if you have a, 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 these extended clips, they're going to give you more time, but you know, studies show just by you saying, who who's going to say, well, how much time am I going to have for an extended clip? Oh, they're going to give me 10 more years for that? Nobody's thinking that. Then I'm not going to do it now. I'm going to get 10 extra years. Hell no. If I can get this, I'm going to get it. I'm going to use it. You know, you don't know these things until you've been to the system. And then you realize, yeah. you know, you're selling these drugs close to a thousand yards within the right. schoolyard. That's an extra charge. Yep. You you yeah. you have a bulletproof vest. That's a you're a convicted felon. That's a that's an extra charge. All these extra charges are piling up on you, and then you don't know these things at the time. You you have no concern about oh they can slap another ten years because you think you're not going to get arrested. You think you're going to you probably get away with a couple of things, but sooner or later the the laws of uh, average are going to catch up to you. But you know one of the things we talk about Omar, you know like how can you divert somebody from taking this path, th this path. I think that I think that church is a great thing. Yeah. You know, church is a great. Every time I go to church, and I, I don't go as often as I could, you know, 
some days I'm working that day or whatever. Um, it's like, uh, to me, it's you, it was put in, in terms of you have a gas tank and you go to, you go to church and it's putting fuel for your soul. This is a fuel for your soul. You leave church. Nobody leaves church in an angry mood. Nobody leaves church in a negative hater mood. Everybody that leaves the church, if it's a good church, it's an uplifting church, you're going to go, you're going to feel uh, uplifted and you're going to feel, you're going to feel like, you know, in a better frame of mind. So, you know, church would be a good thing too. You know? Yeah. I think that's why um, it's, it's funny you bring that up because I was thinking earlier about, like I always end my podcast with a scripture, right? It's Matthew four sixteen. Uh, uh, the people who sat in, in darkness have seen a great light and upon those who sat in the region and the shadow of death, light has dawned. And then the reason that, that uh, scripture, like, like when I was praying, when I was starting this podcast, I wanted it to be more than just me. I, I wanted God in it. And uh, so I was praying and that scripture, when I read that scripture, it reminded me of the city of Chicago, like the people that are sitting in darkness, like in spiritual darkness and sin, whether it be stealing, all this robbing and killing. And I, it just like, um, I, I was reading an article. I believe that Chicago was like the, I forget the title, like the uh, murder capital of the United States. I forget how many years in a row. And then that's part of that scripture where uh, it says those that sat in the region, the region in the shadow of death. So that's like what Chicago, unfortunately, is known for, for the region of shadow and death. And then a uh, uh, light has dawned. And the, the scripture that came to mind also is when Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall, shall uh, walk in the light and not walk in darkness. So I believe spiritually that that's the reason I do this, too, to share testimonies that point people to him. So um, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. Definitely. I, I, I would agree that's a way to reach it. And for me. I found that that's a way to break these uh, uh, generational uh, strongholds and curses. Because now I look at my children, like uh, uh, for me, I was fortunate enough that, that when God came into my life, uh, my girlfriend at the time was pregnant with my daughter. So the, the, I only had my, my son, Angel, which is my, my wife's son. And I when I got with her, he was one year old. So he got to see that, that bad side or that, you know, the, I would say that dark side of me. And when God changed my life around, my daughter and my son that followed seen the transformed man, the, the man that was born of God's spirit. So I would say, well, what I've seen is that God could, could change a man from the inside out. Uh, uh, Dr. Erwin Lewis Cole said that uh, many a man can change his way, but only God can change his nature. So I, for, for me, I believe it's important to start here in the inside to change the heart. Uh, I believe it is in Ezekiel where it says he will take that heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. I believe that a lot of men out there have that heart of stone. They, they're, they're hardened because the, unfortunately the city makes you like this hardened. You, you, it's almost like you got to harden yourself to survive, you know, out there. But God could definitely turn that heart around and use it for good, you know, if we allow him to. So God it certainly <clears throat> changes my life. One of the great things I do, there's a lady across the street of Yaha and I see her gardening and, uh, you know, I was I, I was uh, unknowledgeable as far how much water should I uh, uh, feed my plants. And so she came, the Mexican lady, old lady, we had a nice conversation. I had a great time with her. She was educating me on all the things that I don't know about how to how to how much water to put and, and how many times to uh, water my plants and stuff. And this is a this is a great uh, pleasure of mine, you know, stuff like that. And it's just uh, I, th- I, I uh, attribute it all to, to God changing things in my life, my mentality. Because once upon a time, I don't even care about it. I don't even care about the flowers, you know. I get my flowers for my girl on Valentine's Day, that's it. But uh, now to see them bloom and, and see see the, the fruits of my labor, <clears throat> you know, uh, uh, caring for this uh, beautiful plant and seeing it bl- blossom and bloom, it, it, I, I really I really find that very enjoyable yeah. for me. Yeah, it, it's, it's funny you bring that up because we were walking on the side of my house. You were looking at the plants. Like, what is that? What kind of plant is that? You asked me the name. Yeah. Like, I don't even know what that is, man. But uh, you're I right. Yes, you, yeah. you, you know what? Uh, for me, uh, gardening is uh, therapeutic, man. I don't know if, if you've been doing some gardening oh, since. Yeah, been... I was doing. I was doing some gardening. I. Um, it might sound weird, but you know, I had some weeds. I think those weeds have a, a right to live too. Okay. Not just on my property because you may, you may, you're making the property not look as good. But uh, you know, so just just planting things. You know, I uh, I put some bird, uh, some grass seed out there, and, and you know, I love birds too. The birds were eating the grass seeds. Oh, come on, man! I'm feeding you enough bird seed to leave my <laughs> leave, leave my, leave, grass, leave my alone. grass seed alone. 
but it's it's kind of similar. But you know, all these things are blessings. Before yeah. I came to prison, I wouldn't even think about things like that. And you know, I remember when we were in the neighborhood, my cousin and I. There was a guy. He served some time in prison, and when he came out, you know, he he happened to be passing by us, and um, we're like, we invite him. Come come on, come come hang out with us. You know, we were drinking some Boone's Farm, and he was <laughs> like, uh, when well, he looked at us like we were lepers, like, oh no. I, 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 I told a couple guys, man, a guy, a guy got, got soft. Yeah. Prison made him a soft guy. Nah. He don't even want to come around us. That's what I was thinking. Yeah. But now that I know, this man was on parole. His viol- he would have violated his parole right then, and right then and there. So if you come to jail, you come to prison, you're going to realize it's not a fun time. You know, yeah. you're going to be locked up when you could be laying in bed with a girl. Right? Yeah. But you, in, instead, you'll be in prison and locked in the cell instead of enjoying the outside, you know? Yeah. You, you know, when you bring up a good point about that, because, uh, like, I think uh, like when somebody shows, you know, like in the neighborhood, love, you know, you, you were love, love, right? Love this or love that. And uh, they they look at you, like you mentioned, oh, this guy got soft, this guy is weak. And a lot of, a lot of times these guys, they want to turn their life around, you know, they, they want to marry, take care of their children. And we look at them as weak. And a lot of, unfortunately, a lot of times their own guys come, come at, uh, at them instead of supporting that change, you know, so I, I think that's another area that needs to change. Like the mentality, man, like it's to, to me, it was sad to see that guys that let's say the opposition didn't take them out and they made it, let's say into their forties or even close to 50. And then they want to walk away and now your own guys want to get you. And then to me, when I look back on like, man, that's, that's sad, man. Like that, that's, that, that's what it comes to at the end. Sometimes. I saw a guy like that. I saw some young guys that misinterpreted the guy this guy wanted to live a different sort of life, and they thought that he was a, a pushover. And I, and I actually told one guy, man, that dude, will, that dude right there, man, you just don't know. Uh, it's like the, the toughest, um, somebody like Bruce Lee, you know, uh, he can go on a bar. They want to challenge him because they say, you're the toughest guy. Let me take the toughest guy on. And then they find out that he was no joke or the best gunslinger. You know, this gunslinger didn't have to brag. He didn't have to show that he was the fastest uh, draw in the old days because he knew it. He was securing it, you know. And so, you know, the people could say that if you say, you know, oh, my man, you know, I forgive you, bro, for what you did. That's soft. No, that's not soft, you know. You know, that's not soft at all because that's strength. You know, that's strength to to say if you're worthy of the forgiveness, then I extend that to you. If and What do I say worthy, you know? Uh, if you harm me and and you still revel in that and you haven't changed your mentality and you wish me bad ill, I'm not forgiving you, you know, and you might call me a sinner for not forgiving you. I'm just being an honest person. You right. know? But if you are sincere, I'm talking about sincerity. Yeah. If you're a sincere person and, and you're and, and you're worthy of that, I'm going I'm to give that to you, you know. Gotcha. You want to ch- I mean, Oh, no, I mean, you hit you all are hitting really good points as far as change. The change happens from within. It's no different than a, a dolphin, someone that's addicted to some type of substance. They have to be willing to do it. They can go to all of uh, the rehab centers in the world, but unless they take that step to change themselves or the way, you know, they're living, it's not going to, it's not going to work. You know, it's when they accept that, you know, that they have a problem and they want to change, then it happens. You know, it's the same thing with any lifestyle. If I'm living the gang lifestyle, drug lifestyle, whatever it may be, unless you're willing to change, it's not going to happen. And I do think that the church plays a pivotal role in getting people to come back and realize that they can change. And it's sad that, you know, people look at people in prison when they want to become what they call, quote, unquote, a born again Christian or, or take on, you know, uh, accepting God as their Lord and Savior. Um you know, it's, it's, they looked at at a certain way, you know, like, oh, he gave up, you know, he's weak, he's this, you know, and these are just, like I said, the same thing, how we look at somebody, oh, he's a schoolboy, you know, oh, he's a square, he's a, a lame, he's a this, he's a that, you know, when really those are the things that we should be striving yeah. for, you know, it somehow got twisted and we, we look at it, things uh, in a backwards uh, sort of way. So, you know, I just hope that, you know, people will come back to the church. I think that, um, you know, it's moving slightly in that way. I see like the Victory Outreach and Pil- in Pilsen. There's another uh, church. Uh, I'm, I can't remember their name. They now are establishing themselves in uh, in uh, South Lawndale. So, I'm, you know, you see the back of the yards. They have that things going on with the Precious Blood Ministries. So there is that hope that you see, you know, these churches or people that are doing that work emerging in these communities. It's just 
hopefully that they can touch these people, that they can change. I found a good, I found a, a, a very nice place, a Lion Ministries, the, the logo's on my hat. Okay. And, uh, and well, well, what is that in the middle? Is that like a flame? It's, or? it's, a, it's a lion, it's a symbol for the church. Okay. And, uh, I, you know, when I go there, I feel, I always feel uh, up, uh, uplifted and everything like that. And so it's just, it's just, it's for my own personal, it's, it's for my own personal growth. Yeah. You know, there, there it is. Like, like I said, you, should, you can't misinterpret somebody who wants to do good as being soft. He's a wash. He's a washed up guy. He's a has been. What has he done lately, or anything like that? Because then you'll find something different the hard way, yeah. and then that's better. Just avoid all of that stuff, and you know, live your life, yeah. stay in your lane. Let that guy stay in his lane, and then you won't have problems. Nobody will have problems. You yeah. have, you know. Problems free. You know? Yeah, I, I know. Uh, uh, earlier, you you brought up the, the warrior, the warrior uh, in us, uh, and uh, I was reading a book. Uh, Craig Groeschel was a pastor, and he was talking about um, in Genesis where it says that we were created in the image of God uh, as as men. You know, men, men. He created male and female in the image of God, and then in Exodus three fifteen, he says that uh, the the Lord is a warrior, and the Lord is His name. So then he 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 tied them together. He said. Uh, if if we're created in his image and he's a warrior, there's part in us already that desires to fight. And he was talking about, man, he said that a, a warrior without a cause to fight for will fight against anything. And then uh, there was a scripture where he was talking about like uh, the men were commanded, uh, all right, fight, fight for your uh, wives, fight for your children, fight for your families. And unfortunately, when there's nobody there to teach us that that's another way to fight. So a lot of times, let's say like coming to church, you think, oh, you got to be soft or weak now. No, you you come to God. He he wants you to keep that same energy, but now you're fighting for for a, um, a right cause or a godly cause. Now you're fighting for your marriage. You're fighting not to go through divorce or we'll say like the previous generations. There was none but divorce and fidelity and all these things. Now you're trying to model for your children that it is possible, man, to to live a peaceful life to raise your children right. And it's setting like a new, um, starting like a new cycle, I guess, in the family. So, so if you think about, think of uh, community leaders, well, I'll call them community heroes. The ladies that, the, uh, uh, the ladies that went on this hunger strike to build the Little Village High School. They went on a hunger strike for weeks. I've been on hunger strikes in prison. When when, when did this happen? I, I I remember hearing about that. Like yes, the 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 year the, the Little Village High School. I was in prison. That, that, that was some years ago, though, right? That was yeah, a while was back. A couple, couple of decades okay. ago. Couple, yeah, yeah. It wasn't that long ago. Right. You know, they didn't have that high school in that neighborhood. So if you're from that neighborhood and they want to send you, if you're from that part of uh, 2060, they want to send you Farragut High School. And if you're from just coming from there, you might have problems or whatever or whatever other high school. So these ladies demanded from the politicians who are supposed to be serving the community and they went on these hunger strike. I know a hunger strike is not easy. I've been on hunger strikes in prison. They deny me my rights. And, uh, you know, everybody likes to eat, you know, and uh, I was only uh, I was only drinking water. I wouldn't even drink coffee or anything like that. And I went on the hunger strikes, not to nothing to play with these hunger strikes. And these ladies went. And to me. Why are there why are there images in the, in the neighborhood? Don't put the gang uh, graffiti on there. Put that ladies get the uh, artists. There's so many of them. Put those ladies down there. They're our person. They're my personal heroes. Yeah. The ones who who made it possible to have this high school there, and um, you know honor them. Those are the ones they say. Oh, he's a legend in um, Little Village, or right. she's a legend in the village. Now, legend for what? Let that person be the 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 the, the legend that we look up to. Yeah. And we did something positive for that community. So we got to start uh, start uh, uplifting others or like viewing, I guess, having the, a different role model in a sense, I guess. Yeah, different people we revert. Why yeah. would you revert somebody who, you know, like when I was out of state, uh, every time I saw the news, 4th of July, oh, Chicago had a record number of shootings. And these guys in the prison, man, you from Chicago? Are you from the area? Yeah, I'm from the area. And um, they're glorifying this this activity. And I'm thinking... You grow up for this activity. You don't got to live there, you know. No. If you live in that neighborhood and some bullets are coming through the wall and they're shooting your grandchild or something like that, then you're not going to think this it's such a good thing. You know? Yeah. It affects you personally, you're not going to think it's such a good thing, you know. Yeah, yeah for sure. Yeah, that's true. Uh, yeah, I mean, like I said, uh, this month is going to be the 16th of September. We've seen what happened on the Cinco de Mayo. I would just hope that we don't see a, a, a repeat of that, you know, that people can celebrate, uh, you know, Mexican Independence Day, Mexican Pride, you know, and get out there and enjoy it, you know, because I remember he'll, me and him, 
it used to be fun, even though the, the cops would harass us sometimes. But the times that we could enjoy it, you know, it was a time that we, you know, yeah. sit there and enjoy the the parade, man. You know, see everyone coming down there, the different people, you know, doing whatever on their floats, you know, the music. It was just, you know, the food, et cetera, you know. And so I hope that that doesn't happen uh, on the 16th of September, that people right. will actually, you know, come together and not let that happen. Um you know, like he said, the, the church, I go to the New Covenant Church on the north side in Humble Park uh, near Division and Kedzie. Um, there's a lot of system impacted people and I go there and, you know, you do walk away feeling good. You know, I, every time I go there, I don't go all every week because, you know, sometimes I'm I'm working, unfortunately. But, um, yeah, I mean, uh, I think that, you know, people need to have that in their life uh, if they really expect to find some peace and, you know. Uh, getting back to, you know, centering themselves and, you know, finding a purpose. Yeah. When I speak about church, you know, like to me, um, one of the things that I, I dislike uh, very much is a uh, hypocrite. So I'm not going to be a uh, prophesy. I'm not going to be preaching to you. And then I talk to talk, but I don't walk the walk. Yeah. And, and I'm not saying I'm doing anything wrong or anything like that, but um, I'm not asking anybody to look at me as being an example of anything. I'm speaking about what's good for you. And I'm telling you what's good for you. You go if you go to a church, the right church, some church might be born to you. You might not uh, it might not affect you at all. But if you find the right uh, mix of the church right there, you're gonna you're gonna be uplifted. So you you know you consider what, it, what is, who 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 is this benefiting? It's benefiting you, and it's by benefiting you, it's gonna benefit others because you're gonna be in a good frame of mind, and you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna pass that positivity on to the next person. You know. And, and that's a, and that's a good thing, you know. Oh, yeah, if I sure. tell you, let's go work out in the gym. That's a good thing. That's yeah. a positive thing, you know. Or these things that are good for 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 your phys- physicality and also good for your soul. No, oh, yeah, it's all around. That's what I was doing. Uh, I used to do the workout in the word. I don't know if I shared with you guys, but we used to work out for an hour and then get in the, the Bible study. So I was uh, looking at it like a physical and spiritual ed- ed- uh, ed- ed- edification, you know, like all around. And then it, yeah, you have to do something for your wife or your girlfriend. <laughs> do something romantic <laughs> and do take on a date night or do something good for that. And then you got your basis cup. Do something for your children. You know? That's actually number one, man. You know, I'm gonna, uh, yeah, yeah, that is one. I forgot to mention that, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, that's good. That's a good thing there no yeah hey, you know i know we've been t- t- touching some heavy topics you know some serious stuff but i want to maybe change it up a little bit what, what, what are some things that you guys are, are, are looking forward to do like maybe some um oh man uh, what's the word like a bucket list now now that you guys got this freedom i know it was 42 years do you have a list of man you know maybe some fun activities or some some things that Me you want to knock out yeah. so now okay uh been out since december there's some things that i have not been to the beach I have not been, I have not sw- even swam yet. You know, yeah. life has came oh. to me and, you know, I got, I got, um, I got really focused on my home. That's, that's like my focus. You know, my focus wasn't, uh, some getting some jewelry or some other things like that. My, my focus was like, uh, getting, uh, I want to recline. I want a leather recliner couch. <laughs> you know? I want an Island in my kitchen. You know, I want, I want some things. I want a soft pillow. I want a new, uh, bedroom set for my guest bedroom and and you know I want to make my lawn very lush and and, and this this that's my focus. But in the, in the, in the process of all these things, some things have uh, passed me by. But it, it's not too late because thank God, you know, thanks to the Lord, you know, I'm I'm healthy yeah. and I, I'll get to uh, get around to doing those things. I told you I took one bath so far. <laughs> it was a marvelous thing, you know. <laughs> I don't know. If most people just take a shot. No, yeah. That bath I was like, oh my God! I was like, did, oh, did you Jesus. soak in there for a while? Man, or I what? soaked and I almost got turned the Grape, you know, like <laughs> turn to a grape. <laughs> yeah, gotcha. yeah, 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 yeah. It'll prove. Like, yeah, yeah, like, yeah. Oh my god! And then also have me a glass of wine too, so that helped it a little bit yeah. while I was while I was laying in that in the bathtub. But uh, you know, we'll get around to those things. Yeah. I, I know, I I know, I will. You know. Okay, but that that's I know you mentioned the beach. Is that one you want to yeah, do we'll like experience? Beach. Maybe some traveling. You know, maybe oh, yeah. some traveling. And, any places in particular that is man that that I don't know that you just man I, I want to check it out one day. You know, like I would say, probably Italy. Mm-hmm. You know, I read some books on a a, tra- a memoir of uh, somebody that went to uh, Italy and they went to some nice, really nice places with good food. I like Italian food a lot, and so maybe maybe some uh, part of Italy I would, I would like to go gotcha. to. You know? Now, you know, let, let, let me ask you about that, like a memoir. Like in there, like did did you find, let's say, reading that? Did even though you were there where you were at, did it help your mind like escape? Are you reading it? Like oh, maybe yeah. visualizing some of the stuff you're reading? Or? Well, when I was in uh, when I was in Tam's prison, you know, like I went to, 
seven and a half years without TV. You know, um, after a year of uh, no write-ups, you're eligible for TV. And uh, at that time, in Tam's prison, uh, the prison cell, they had a concrete shelf. And at that time, they sold the bubble TVs. So a bubble TV and a radio would not fit on there. So you had a choice. You want your TV or you want your radio? I chose my radio. And the reason why I chose my radio, because at nighttime, this was a late night show, the BBC. And the British Broadcast uh, Company Come, Corporation yeah. would, would have the correspondence all throughout the world. And I would close my eyes and I would listen to them say, uh, we're now in Antarctica. And you could hear the wind blowing. They had the acoustics of the microphone. You could hear the wind blowing. And I would, and I would just visualize myself. To, uh, how is it that I could actually feel cold? And then next thing you know, the next storyline, the next segment of the story, they were in Afghanistan. Again, I close my eyes, and and they'll say we're walking up to Kandahar, in Kandahar, and you can hear the rocks tumbling down, and that was my escape. That was my away from away from the prison, and I was be so focused on that. When they would have the mentally ill guy, there was always a mentally ill guy in a chair banging all night, boom, because he wanted attention. He was mentally ill. He was mentally disturbed, and I was even able to close him out because I was focused so much on the on these stories, you know. And that was that was my escape at that time, you know. Mm-hmm. And sometimes now, like, I marvel at how far, you know, I put a Facebook post when I was driving on the expressway. And I was like, a few months ago, I was in a prison cell. And, you know, in Cook County Jail, you know, we had uh, certain times we could be on the tier and then we have to go lock up. And it's always seemed like, you know, like if we were put on CNN, I wanted to watch what was happening in the political world. And then they'll say, lock up. Uh, man, and, and sometimes they would, the officers wanted to lock you up early. They would cheat you out of five minutes. And five minutes meant a lot because yeah. it, you could see that story within five minutes, but they're locking you up. And, I, and sometimes we'll have to go tussle with them. You know, hey, listen, man, I ain't going nowhere to I, give me my whole time. You know, I'm not trying to be difficult with you, but yeah. I'm, I'm going to serve my rights of what I have. This is what I, was afforded to me. And, I'm gonna, and, and just imagine that. You're getting stressed out. Your world is becoming... Like it's so stressful because you're fighting for five minutes to watch that story that's going to come on within five minutes, but they want to lock you up. And now we have this freedom. And one thing that um, I'm very appreciative is that I haven't, I haven't lost uh, my sense of gratitude for things, my appreciation things, the magnitude of things. I still look at a flower and marvel at its beauty. And uh, I don't think I will ever lose that because I went a long time without seeing one. And, and, and now that when I see them, they're just like blessings. I still think, and people might think I'm crazy or something. I see the tree swaying. I really believe that's God telling me that tree is saying hi to me. Hello. I say hello to it back. You know, yeah. If you see me one day, Omar, you see me waving that plant, <laughs> I haven't lost my mind. I'm not going crazy. Right. I'm just appreciating the nature. No, no. Yeah. And, and uh, hugging the trees. I believe no, you I mentioned you hugged three trees <laughs> when you got three, out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's yeah. a good thing right there. No, no, no. What, what about you, uh, Jimmy? Any, like a list? Like a, well, I know that, the like question they, was like a bucket I, list or things you want to do. Or, I haven't been in a bath yet and I haven't yeah. swam yet. Those are things. I mean, the summer came and went so quick. Uh, I couldn't believe it. But, um, yeah, I mean, just like him, I want to go to like the south of France, south of Europe, south Italy, uh, maybe Greece, you know, other places like that. Somewhere warm, some, you know, that's why I say it's south. <laughs> um, but yeah, I want to do things like uh, I want to parachute. I want to parachute. No way, yeah. I remember there was a ride they used to have. Uh, those that remember, uh, 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 um, well, I might be taking it way, way, way back, but uh, we used to have an amusement park over there on Grand Avenue, you know, and um I remember they had this parachute ride and you can only be a certain uh, age to get on there. And I told, I lied. Um, they let me on there anyway, but uh, yeah, I really enjoyed that. And we, David and I went to Acapulco as kids, you know, and we got on this thing and I just wanted to go on this parakeeting where the boat takes you up, you know, and it's just that, that, how could I say it? This, uh, I found it really exhilarating and liberating to be up there like floating. Oh, so you, you actually did it at a young age? When yeah, it was parakeeting. That they pull you and then you come up. Yeah, yeah, you're, yeah. you're getting the air. Yeah, you're, yeah, but yeah, I want to yeah. have that feeling again, but out of a plane. I want to do it out of a plane, you know, jump out of a plane on a pair. That's one of the things you talked about. Bucket. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Bucket That's bucket. one of the things I want to do, you know. It's interesting for me when I talk to other guys who have been locked up a long time and I never ridicule or think that's weird. Nothing's weird to me. And none of those things, they, right. they, the desires they, they want to do. If you, if one person tells me if my cousin wants to jump out of the airplane, hey, God bless him, let him jump out the airplane. Not for me, you know. What I mean, I will do I'll, you know, I will, I'll, I probably would want to go. I probably would want to uh, probably volunteer to go uh, build uh, uh, to uh, plant some trees with somebody in a 
something like that. That's that's like a. I would never had that that desire or pleasure before yeah. prison, but somehow or another, nature just really really has an effect yeah. on me like that. There, you know. So I don't I don't I don't care about uh, getting a. a uh, renting a big uh, boat or uh, yacht and going in Bermuda or something like the Bahamas or whatever, I would rather I would rather do something more simple. That's that's my personal. No, yeah, yeah, yeah. But if if that's your thing, right? They, hey, man, listen, man, more power to you, bro. I understand that that's that's what you dreamed of. Right. You were in prison and you dreamed about these things, and uh, and now they come to fruition. And so, hey, thank thank God for you. You know. Yeah, yeah. Oh, definitely. I mean, after that much time, I think, man. You guys deserve to whatever whatever that looks like, man. To at least well, experience well, it. You, well, you know you what I'm saying? Like about like the flowers you find gardening therapeutic, and it is nature is therapeutic. I mean that's a that's a fact. You know, uh, definitely. My therapist tells me all the time you need to immerse yourself in nature more. You know, go for a long hike. You know, simple thing. I go up at the beachfront and. You know, there's areas where you have you know trees and whatnot. I'm not there like to watch the boats and all that stuff. But to be there in that moment, see the nature, they got a bird sanctuary in certain spots. You know, I don't like the geese. I'm not particularly fond of geese, but they have a purpose too, you know, because yeah. uh, they crap everywhere. You yeah, know? yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, geese are geese. People feed them. They tell you, don't feed the geese. Right, right. People are feeding them all the time. You know, I love the ducks, you know. So it's it's those, like you said, those simple things, are uh, they do make you feel human. My girl, my girl. Gets a big kick out of me because every time I go step into the backyard to feed the birds, the birds scatter. And I always just talk to the birds. Hey, don't be scared of me. Don't you know that I love you? I will never harm you. I will never in my life hurt these birds. I love you. Well, who thinks feeding you all the time? Me. So you don't have to scatter. And the first thing I say to them when I step out in the backyard, don't be scared. Don't be scared. And my girl's laughing at me. <laughs> She's talking to the birds again, huh? Yeah. I'm trying to get them to understand. I'm not trying to harm them. I'm trying to help That's them. Right. You know? No, hey, that, that that's wonderful acting, man. I, I know you, I still remember a uh, uh, part of your story where you said you took off, uh, you had been on concrete, I forget how many years, so many years, 17, at 17, 17, and then you took off your shoes and your socks and you were just walking in the grass and you're like, man, people probably think I'm crazy, but yeah. 17 yeah, we, years of concrete to yeah. just to feel the, the dirt and the grass under your feet. Feel the soil, like, uh, yeah, because there's guys in prison, they bug up. You know, we we say they're bugging up, they're going crazy, they lose their mind kind of way. And I used to think those guys were soft. I say, you know what? You can't handle the pressure. You a soft, you know, and I want to say profanity, you know, yeah, yeah, soft yeah. dude. You know, but uh, then I know everybody has their own unique experiences, what they uh, what they went through, and uh, who might have judged them uh, if they had that effect on them. Some guys are cut off for some things. Some guys are not cut off for some things. And uh, I was 17 years without feeling the earth, without feeling the soil. And so when I went out to the yard, when they finally let me out, I was like shocked. I, I felt almost like uh, I made parole. I was out there and I took my shoes off, took my socks, and I was, was walking on the grass and I seen a, a dandelion. It was a dandelion. I thought it was a daisy, but it was actually was a dandelion. Picked the dandelion, I was looking at the dandelion, and then I turned around and there was like six or seven guys looking at me. And I first started to explain to them, you know, hey, man. But then I said to myself, I'm not explaining nothing to <laughs> none of these guys. These guys right. I don't know nobody, no explanation, nothing. I do what I want to do. And if I want to smell that down line, that's what I'm going to do. And But, um, you know, it had this effect on me that uh, it was just a, such a great creation, you know. Yeah. Hey, you know what I, I want to bring up? Like, uh, I don't know when people listen to your story, well, one of the, the I say, most common comments that I would get is a lot of people were amazed how you were able to maintain your sanity, I guess, and how well... Like you express yourself, communicate it, and I just wanted to share that. Like uh, after forty-two years, that that that's one of the things that a lot of the people noticed. And what, uh, what would you attribute that to? Like, well, for me, my personal my in my life <clears throat> before I came to prison, it wasn't strange for me uh, the police to come raid my house all the time. You know, like they would uh, they would raid my house, like they would. Uh, you know, they were alleged my father was, uh, you know, to something. Who knows what they were alleged, these, uh, you know, charges, these empty charges. And they'll come raid the household. Like, if they raid my cell in the prison. It's just it's just a continuation of what they did. They raided my house and when I was on the, uh, on the outside. And now they're raiding my cell. It's just a continuation. Now, thank God now I don't have those issues because I'm not doing anything where they could be misconstrued, that I was involved in something to give them the, a basis to come and knock down the, my, my doors or something like they did all my life. That's what they did all my life. And now that I have this piece where I don't have to worry about those things, it's just a, it's a, it's a big relief. But as far as uh, how I was able to maintain my sanity or something, there was just a formula that worked for me. And that was, like I said in ta the other podcast, I went to sleep at the same time. I woke up at the same time. I had a very uh, 
strict structure, uh, a, a routine that I would stick to. You know, I will exercise. I always exercise, you know, you know, and I come out here and I see some guys that are younger than me that look older than me. And this, they didn't take care of their bodies. And so I did take care of my body. He took care of his body. He still take care of his body now. <laughs> and so, you know, like, um, you know, praying. Praying was, was a big thing. Yeah. Getting fresh air. When Tams, you're in an environment that's like on an airplane. You, you're breathing in the same air. And, you know, they have all these airborne uh, viruses and uh, pathogens coming through the air. And we will, I would go outside. And uh, I always said it was like a, a blackboard. A, a school blackboard. You had all this writing on there and it's all the clutter of these thoughts in your mind. And when I went outside, it was like somebody took an eraser and erasing the blackboard is now clean. Now my, my, my brain is cleansed and I'm, I'm able to relax a little bit. And that was a simple uh, oxygen to my brain, just getting simple oxygen to my brain. So there was a, there was a strict uh, routine that I was in. I noticed that that was uh, the recipe for success and the recipe was f for failure was doing opposite things, you know, staying up all night and all this stuff here and not exercising. And, uh, you know, like, uh, your energy, you're going to get it off one way. You're going to get it off another way. And, and if you get it off the right way, do a bunch of push ups, crunches, all these things, uh, it's better than, uh, pacing back and forth going nuts, like a, like a bull in a, in a, in a China store, uh, you know, ready to knock some stuff down, better go get that exercise on. We'll do pull-ups, you know, some of my friends, you know, we, we improvise ways to, to, we didn't have weights. We didn't have, uh, uh, machines. So we will have to work what we had, whatever we had, we'll make the, we'll improvise and do the best. And, and that kept us stable, you know, okay. but still like Jimmy said, he's right. We are traumatized and it's nothing yeah. uh, weak to say about that. You know, I told you the story when we went to the supermarket and they wanted yeah. to check our, our, our bag and, you know, something triggered in me like deeply. And I just felt like, Okay, here we go again. You know, accusing us falsely because that's what they were doing. You know, they weren't doing their job like just randomly. They stopped us. You know, and uh, I was thinking like, here we go again, falsely accused, and uh, for no for no reason at all. And so you know, these are it's like um, a soldier. You know, I have a friend that served in the military, and uh, he was uh, subjected to those IEDs, improvised explosive devices, these things they were put on the on the road. And so now, when you know, thank God for his wife being so patient with him because if he goes down the road and there's some garbage on the road, he, he flashes back. It's a trigger to him that this might be a, a bomb, even though we're in the United States here. And we have these triggers. My cousin and I have triggers. My friends that, that serve a long time in prison have these certain triggers, you know. And, um, you know, like uh, uh, they say, this guy's coming up for his post-conviction. We want support to go in the courtroom. Would you please... Uh, come and support this man. This is an innocent man, like you were an innocent man, and we want to show the court and the judge and the state's attorney that he is not a forgotten man. He has a support base, and would you please come to court? And, you know, okay, I will. You know, I, I will do that, but I don't want to do that because I, the last thing I want to see is a judge. I had a bad experience with this judge. He had, you know, like the, the way his ruling was, you know, I, I, don't, I don't personally, like, that's him. Must be a stronger man than me to go before these judges again because I don't even want to see a judge anymore. You know, yeah. last well, what, thing I want to see is judge. Well, what about you, uh, Jimmy? How, what would you attribute? Like maybe I know I, I, on your podcast too, you mentioned how there are like lingering effects. You know, the oh, yeah, trauma. Absolutely, the absolutely. You have these effects, like uh, hearing like some people in the supermarkets uh, they have walkie talkies to communicate, and sometimes you have that uh, reverb come on there, and that reminds me of you know what the officers used to have when there was an incident going down. So there's a lot, a lot of things like that can, tri can trigger me. Um, yeah, you have that residual effect of incarceration. But like he said, for me, um, I was always reading. He knows I always used to study even when I wasn't in school. I, I love to read. Um, and I loved, and, you know, praying, staying focused, uh, you know, having a regiment was also that running, playing sports, like to play basketball, handball, and things like that. So, you know, if you if people that didn't follow that type of lifestyle, you could see that, you know, they, like I said, they quickly aged or they passed. Some of them are dead now, you know, and they're younger than us. They didn't, they got out and, you know, they just never took care of themselves and have a host of, of problems. But, um, you know, I just think that, you know, a lot of people need to understand that, you know, even though you're out, um, you know, it's that stigma, you know, even those that serve time, not par paroled because there's no real parole, but, you know, they're out it's that permanent punishment. You got that, if that, that black box that you check where you're ever convicted of a felony or this, you know, and you don't fill it out, they're going to find out, you know? So 
uh, there's it, it precludes them from getting you know good good employment, etc. I think both of us are fortunate we're working and and whatnot. But um, yeah, I mean um, if you don't have the wherewithal within yourself, uh, you're not gonna make it in there. You, it'll break you. It will break you. And I've seen it happen a lot of times. And um, yeah, it's it's just it's 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 just the fact of the system. You know? We're we're forever. He and I and others that were served time in prison for a crime we did not do. We're still. We're still labeled a certain kind of way. I remember when I was in Tams, there was a guy that was uh, convicted of uh, a rape. And, uh, you know, uh, everybody, uh, they want to ostracize this guy because they say he's a rapist. Nobody likes a rapist. And then the DNA evidence proved he was not the rapist. Scientific proof. He is not the guy. You know, and then, you know, there still was a lot of people that said, man, I don't care what that DNA said. That dude is a creep. He did it. You know, and, and like the same thing with us. If I, you know, if I was to tell my neighbors don't know anything about me, unless they're going to see this podcast, you know what I'm saying? And who knows? I'm going to blur your face, man. <laughs> so, but like you say, yeah, at the time, but you know what? We were, we were, we were falsely accused. Yeah. We were wrongly in prison. And they'll say, say, well, you know, they, you know, it was a technicality. They didn't read you your rights. No, none of that. We were right. actually innocent men and we were wrongly convicted and the state took decades of our lives and they stole our youth and everything else, you know, and, but, um, some people still, still think, uh, well, uh, yes, you, you did it. You know, so right. this is like, I'm not trying to convince anybody anything. No, no, you, right, you right. Have your mind made up, you main, you make your mind up. That's what it is. You're stuck on that. And, uh, I remember one time I saw a TV show where this where this lady, uh, the police officers wanted to convict this guy, and they had mugshots and on the table, and they said, "Look at these mugshots. Look at them. They're pushing this one particular." Yeah. And her mind triggered that that's the guy, and it turns out it wasn't the guy. And so then when um, this guy did all his time in prison, and then they found out the guy who fit that the mo, the guy whose the DNA was proven was him, they. That lady still in her mind said, no, no, yeah. I don't care what any of that says. He's the guy. And uh, so, so people have these, 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 these opinions and they're set in their opinions and they think the way they think. And then that's just how they are. That's just what it is. And we're, 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 we're like a, not like a scarlet uh, letter back in the day, put that put <laughs> scarlet on you, but we do, uh, we have this albatross around our neck or something like that. And, you know, it's just something we have to, um, is what this is, the, this, the, the wrongful uh, conviction. Yeah, I mean, absolutely, you know, that we carry a stigma as well, even though that we are exonerated, people may say, okay, they had to have something to do with it. They wouldn't be locked up all that time, you know. So I understand you have, you're always going to have people that have those opinions, naysayers or whatever, you know, and I'm not here to convince them either. Unfortunately, you know, the career that I wanted, I chose, and I'm going to go into law school, uh, God willing, uh, I'm going to, you know, try to get some other people out uh, for as long as I could do that work. Um I'm going to be in courtrooms. Uh, yeah, it is strange going back in there. It's not fun. Just the whole uh, <clears throat> treatment of somebody that's just going there to be an, a, 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 a supporter of somebody. You know, you got to get searched. All these things that, you know, are attached to the carceral system, you know, pat you down. Like I came through, I forgot I had a pen that had a metal clip on the top. It was in my pocket. You know, they tell you empty the pocket. So the thing goes off. They, you would have thought I had a gun. <laughs> Pull me to the side, pat me down. So you're like, man. Uh, we were asked recently to go, uh, in fact, today to go to go support somebody. I wasn't able to go because I work and I was kind of glad, like, like, you know, even though, um, you know, that's going to be my career, it does, you know, again, bring these triggering things because, you know, it's the courtroom is what, you know, got us uh, in the, in, in this, you know, serving all these decades in the first place. So we, yeah. we face all these awkward situations. I went to the dentist. And uh, <clears throat> I was having some dental work done, and and uh, he, he was like, uh, I was like, he said, well, how long? It was it was a bruised tooth. I, you know, I was boxing. I had my mouthpiece in the time bruised my tooth, and so uh, like the doctor said, well, how long have you had that? So well, that's probably thirty years ago. He's like, thirty years. Well, why don't your uh, dentist do something about it? I said, well, you know, <laughs> it's just you know, it's just, it's just one of those things. He said, well, and this guy was persistent, and he wouldn't let it go. And I didn't feel like explaining to him. Maybe yeah. I was in prison. You don't get to choose your dentist. And you don't get to say, I don't like that dentist. I don't like your dental work. I'm going to pick another dentist. And so this guy was persistent in his questions. Well, I, why didn't you just change dentists? I said, well, you know, it wasn't that easy. Well, why wasn't it that easy? And, you know, here I'm sitting in the chair, and I feel like tell man, hey, man, hey, why don't you just quit the questions and just do your work <laughs> and more about what I was doing? You know what I mean? But, the, you know, the same thing like um, when I went from a job, a job interview, they're like, uh, okay, well, we require your uh, – 
your your tax returns from last year. Yeah. You, you know, well, I don't have none. Well, you don't file no taxes. No, it's just you know. And then you have to say, look, man, just here, here's what it is. You know, I was locked up for a case we didn't do. Well, I didn't do. My cousin, we didn't do. And and so these years were these decades. These were not years. These were decades were stolen away from us. And I didn't file any taxes because I was in prison. And so then then and all of a sudden they're looking at you differently. They're looking at you like. Oh man, can we be trust him in, in this company? Yeah. There's no, <laughs> oh, right, right. Yeah. You know, yeah. you, you, now you're labeled something that you're not, you know, because you know the state uh, wrongfully put this put this charge on you, you know. And so these are awkward things that some I sometimes have to. The first guy, I didn't even know about scanning. You know, went to the supermarket, know nothing about scanning, and I didn't know you put your debit card and you had to press the pin number and enter and all that stuff. And uh, it was frustrating for me that my family would have to help me out with this, and people would look at me like I was um, like some kind of uh, uh, imbecile. Or yeah, something. No, yeah, yeah, right, right. Because what's the matter with this guy? You know what I mean? And but uh, this is uh, if you never had to, if you never had uh, exposure to these things, how would you know? How would you yeah. possibly know this is the procedure for this? And these are some things that I'm still I'm still learning, you know. Right. Yeah. For me, it was going to get a car loan. Uh, I had no credit. They're like I had to get my brother in law's co sign. But it, it, the guy was sort of like what he's talking about. He said, "Well, why didn't you? Have, you had bad credit. Yeah. You, went, you you filed for bankruptcy." I said, "No, no, no, no." And I don't feel the need that I have to explain every time. You know why? Why you have zero credit? Now I got a seven twenty twenty score, but back then I didn't have nothing. You know, so it's not an easy thing. Like I was, I was glad when they, he he got. The home, he got it, uh, uh, his loan approved, you know. Uh, he worked to get uh, his his credit score up uh, fairly quickly. So that's a good thing, you know. But, you know, one step at a time, piece by piece, we're putting right. as, as much as we can, you know, back into what society is, you know, expects, not expects of you, but these things that society has available to you, you know. And so now we're just, we're learning all that. We're, net, we're learning as we go along. We're navigating it. Now, this is just, this is the first year that uh, as a homeowner, I'm going to have, uh, I have to go uh, prepare the, for the kids, candy, give kids. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. Ooh, Halloween. Boom. I'm looking forward to that. I'm looking forward to Christmas, decorating a tree. This is mm -hmm. the first tree that I will have decorated in decades, and I'm looking forward to it. And uh, I'm, I'm even open to having, uh, what's that, the ugly sweater you put oh, on? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Give me the ugly sweater. I'll yeah, put yeah, the ugly yeah, sweater yeah. on, and at least just experience these uh, great joys. You know? Right, right. Yeah. Man, see, 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 even like that, I know it's not like I say a bucket list with all these extraordinary things, but it is a list still of yeah. things that you want to experience, things that you want to be a, a, a part of, you know, like. I want to go to a Bears game. I haven't been to a yeah. haven't uh, been Man, to I've never market. been to a Bears game, man. What? So, uh, for uh, real. Good. Let, let, let me know, man. Yeah. I'll join you Let's guys, go, man. man. <laughs> I've never been there for real. What? Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> Chicago for yeah, yeah, man. Uh, hey, uh, okay, quick, quick story. I'll, I'll share this. The the day, um, not, not the day I got saved, but that Sunday it was is a long story, but my, my girlfriend was praying for me to go to church. And man, that that Sunday before the Tuesday where I, where God touched me, I was supposed to go to a Bears game with my brother. He had a ticket for me and everything. But man, I got so wasted the night before. Man, I got into a fight. It was, it was a crazy story. And my brother calls me on Sunday morning. And I'm like, man, I, I can't make it. I was like done. And that was the Sunday before I got saved that Tuesday. So I was supposed to go to Bears game, but it just never no, happened. We'll, we'll go to Bears game. <laughs> so like I've been to outdoor musical venues, right? And uh, music in the park or something like that. Rosemont, Bolingbrook, places like that. And uh, man, I have the best time when I'm there. I was just like, and I look around and I say to myself, man, this is just a marvelous thing. Uh, we've seen the fireworks before. Now they stopped the fireworks over the Navy Pier. Right, right. that. And this was a great experience for me. And uh, so... You know, being deprived of things and now having a, you know, you have it uh, accessible to you is something that makes it more, it just, it amplifies it, you know, amplify your appreciation for this. And, and, and I really, I really find a pleasure in that. And I'm looking forward to these holidays. First Thanksgiving, you know, when I was a kid, we, we had our Thanksgiving together, family having together <laughs> yeah. and, you know, like his sisters, they're such great people. But when we got locked up, they were little girls. So I didn't know them as a person, even my sister. I didn't know her. She was a little girl. And I see that I think she's just a wonderful person. And thank God that you know we have this close relationship now. And um it's just these are just blessings. This is no, just this is just didn't happen to us. These are God's blessings to us now. And that's how I look at it, you know. Right. That's awesome, man. I pray you guys get to enjoy that. Thanksgiving, man. Uh as a speaker of Thanksgiving, man, what's something you want on the menu that maybe that that you know, that you haven't tasted it maybe in a while that you want to. Well, I, I want to share just a real quick story. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. There was one Thanksgiving when we were kids. They had a dog, right? His name was Smart. 
This dog came home. We don't know how he got it. He came home with a whole cooked turkey. I'm not talking about little no way. Oh, I'm not lying. It's a true story. This dog came to the back porch with a whole turkey, and we were just, like, amazed at the fact. We didn't know. He had to steal it from somewhere. I don't know how he got it. He was a why would he, he was a dog that was able, like, to open up fences and, 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 and no things way. like that. Yeah, he was he was a good dog. So it was, it was, it was really, I remember that Thanksgiving. Where, like, yeah. It was just crazy, you know? <laughs> We didn't think at the time he took so many uh, turkey, yeah. fully cooked turkey. We're living on 25th and Spalding. That's oh, yeah. where I grew up on 25th and Spalding. And uh, this, uh, they had the, the animal control van will come around. At first, that dog wasn't ours. It was a street dog. And that dog became our dog because that dog would go on our porch. And when that blue van went by, he'd sit down. Like, I live here. As soon as that van went by, he would go run. No said, way. Check, check yeah. this dog out. He knew. This dog knew. And so then we start feeding dog. You know what, dog? You, you're our dog. And now we call that dog Smart. And that was the name of our, our pet. And he's right. He came on Thanksgiving. He came with fully, tur- fully cooked turkey. And like, wow, this dog was so smart. He brought the turkey home to us. Yeah. yeah. But I, I look forward to you know a traditional turkey meal. But one of the things that my sisters are going to do is that uh, they're going to make mole with the leftover turkey. So I look and I, I like. I remember the leftover turkey, like making a sandwich. You know, put some yeah. Miracle Whip on it, or whatever. You know. So the next day, turkeys. You know, even better. Yeah, yeah. So I look forward. To not only the meal, but the next day meal. Leftovers. The leftover yeah. meal. Gotcha. It's so interesting that uh, yeah. now that, you know, you asked me this question, I never even, I never even, I never even thought of like, I'm going to eat this stuffing or whatever I'm going to eat. I was more uh, focused on the family dynamic, being with my family yeah. and enjoying this day. You know, um, we just went to my cousin, my cousin Miguel. We had a great time. He's a great, fantastic <laughs> yeah, guy. Yeah. We loved this guy. We went to his house and, and I was talking to him about the plants he had on his wall and, uh, you know, he's just a great music teacher and uh, we really enjoy his company. And these things are more important to me than um, the food that was provided or yeah. whatever. You know, uh, just being with my family, that's what matters to me. You yeah. Know? yeah. yeah. You, you know, but it was funny that that food brings the family together, though, right? It's like, I don't know, like uh, the the attraction, like and even like in the in the old days, in the old, in the old Testament, they used to like food was a way to, to conversate. That's so it was, it, yeah, that's it wasn't just break bread. breaking bread, but it was what happened around the table. So I guess that that's the importance of it. You know, it's not yeah. the table itself, but it's what draws them there. And then it's the conversation. It's the gathering, the spending time with family, you know, getting to reconnect. Absolutely. We had a lot that's of awesome. people that had preconceptions of me, you know, and uh, they sat down and then we showed them, you know, the person I am. And they stand there. It's something different from what they, what the, the ideas they had. They, 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 what, what they were maybe expecting to. What they were expecting, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And I don't blame them for expecting that, you know, uh, you know, reputation or character, whatever, right. or whatever they thought, wherever uh, their beliefs came from, whatever fed them those beliefs. Uh, if you see uh, some news media's about it, me at one time, it probably would not be something, uh, you know, that I would be proud of, but it would be something that uh, they would give them those ideas or something like that. But now that they say, you know, like, um, I would I would I would enjoy having conversations over things that I never would have uh, conversed about before. You know, and uh, we're talking about plants. But you know, I have a friend, and if you look at this guy, my my friend John, he's he's like a he looked like a street guy. You know, he's a big dude. He got tattoos and everything. And then, uh, you know, at first I thought he was putting me on because he was like, uh, I, I see that you had a perennial uh, flower there. I said, well, You know, that's a perennial flower. How you know that? He's like, Man, I, if you want one day, I could I could take you to my home and I could show you. We went to his home was like a beautiful garden. He has, like, he planted this shaded perennial because this is a perennial that can grow in shade. And so this is what we're going to have here. And then we went to the nursery. It was like three guys, three friends of mine. We went in there and, uh, like, uh, the older ladies were looking at us coming through there. And, uh, <laughs> said, you know, they got some guys had the, uh, they go t-shirt on with the tattoos and stuff, yeah. you know. And, the, the, we, and I was like, I was like a kid in a candy store. Oh, oh, <laughs> look at that plant. That? Look at that plant right there. Can that, is that an annual plant or is that a perennial plant? And I want to know these things. And uh, that's, that's, like I said, it's one of my great pleasures right now. Man, that, that's awesome. I, I never heard Dave say that about the plants going to the thing like that. It's, that's awesome to hear. But he all the time tells me he likes uh, Menards, uh, you know, uh, Lowe's. Uh, they told me for like- my birthday. They said, your birthday's coming up. You're going to have a birthday party. What should we get you? I said, look, man, I don't want, I don't want, this is what I want. Give me a Home Depot gift card or Menards <laughs> gift card or Walmart gift card and that don't make me happy. Yeah. I don't care about the amount on there, whatever you can afford. That's, I want to be, I want to go to Menards. I want to go buy some home stuff. <laughs> but, you know? but, but Menards, now that they, they we're older, 
It's like Toys R Us, man. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, my friend tells me I have to put blinders on. I'm going down that. Yeah. Oh, man, that's a nice cabinet. Yo. I wasn't even thinking about having a cabinet. I saw the cabinet. Yo, yo. This is this where I'm at right now in my life right here, you know? Okay. No, that's good, man. I mean, I'm sure it's the little things that seem like bringing you joy, man. That's awesome, man. Pretty, pretty continues for you. Yeah. Now, you know, I want to give you guys an opportunity, and I know you guys reached out to come out here. Is there anything we haven't talked about? Something you want to share? Something on your heart? You know, you know, whatever you guys. You know, I just like I said, like I, I like you know, like it struck me being uh and and in some of these areas, I was passing through the area, and I saw that park, and I saw the 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 change and the demographic of the population there, and I saw how developers have gentrified that area, and I'm not upset with any person who. Who's a gentrifier? They're just trying to live their life as well, you know, as best they can. The young people trying to do for, for their own life, and uh, it's just a tragedy to me that you know gang members lost their lives for this area, and you don't even own that area. And this is the same thing happened again and again. And to you know, hopefully your eyes will be open up, and then you could you could change your life because you could always change your life. Yeah, you you, you know what? Going back to um, uh, what's the word we use? M m m mentors. We need men in, in this Hispanic community, Mexican community that are business owners that can mentor others. Like, like I, I know like one thing, like in high schools that they hardly teach. I don't even think they teach you well how to handle finances. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned something about uh, when somebody passes away and the, 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 the hit that the family takes financially, trying to bury their loved one. And uh, I had a coworker tell me, uh, he's a, a, a Af African-American, and he said that how his family, they learn to start getting life insurances. And these are things that I know, like, let's say like growing up, I never heard that you should get a life insurance or things like that. And uh, other communities know about it. And so when somebody passes away, instead of being a, a burden on the family, now in a sense, they're leaving a, a little bit of money for their family instead of the family having to scrounge up money to bury them. So like just, I, I think it's important to have mentors, a businessman, show you how to handle your finances, you know, savings account, checking account, investment, and what have you, or the things that will, now we're raising these men, like you mentioned, it's unfortunate that they died for, let's say, for the black, that area, but they don't own it. How do we get these men to, man, like, to really own property, you know, and help you others? Be, yeah, go you, ahead. Omar, with this platform here, you are a pillar of the community right now. You are, I consider you a pillar of the community because you have a platform to get message out, and that's important. Why do you think we're here? Why do you think we're here right now? We could be doing other things. We're here, and uh, some people say to me, hey, listen, uh, this podcast could uh, financially compensate you. Some other podcast. I'm not interested in that. You know, I'm not, I'm, I, my sincerity is is what I'm speaking on now. You know, this is this is what this is who I am right now. You could you could make your opinion of me however you want. That's fine with me. You know, don't get in my way if, if you mean uh, something bad. But I'm not gonna get in your way either. You know, and and then that's just it. You know, but you're a part of the community and uh, you have a platform and it's a good thing. That's why my cousin and I were here. Man, yeah, it, yeah, yeah. Um, to add to what Dave said, I'm just hoping again, like the 16th of September that. Mexicans show their pride. They celebrate peacefully and enjoy themselves. And we won't see a repeat because, you know, we're better than that. You know, let's show Chicago what, you know, the Chicago Mexican-American community is all about. Show our pride and ha celebrate and, and, and have a wonderful time. But I would say uh, as far as anything else um, um, that I would like to talk about is this. You know, I have this uh, campaign, Build Communities Not Prisons. I help push to get Stateville closed terrible conditions at Stateville Prison. We're going to push next to close Logan. The women have suffering from the same conditions. This is something that I do. Um, it's it's not for everybody. I know everybody doesn't want to hear about closing prisons or making the prisons better for individuals or trying to get people out. But that's something I'm going to be doing a lot of. And I hope that people understand that, you know, what it does it doesn't just affect like us. It didn't just affect our incarceration, our wrongful convictions. It didn't only affect us. It affected our family. It affected some of our friends and then the larger communities that we came from. So, you know, uh, hopefully people will see that and we can see some change in that area as well. I'm glad my primo, yeah. I'm glad my yeah. primo made up the point about the Mexican Independence Day Parade or any uh, parade coming up. Like uh, before, uh, you know, the Ku Klux Klan, they will, they will hang uh, black people, Mexican people, or somebody, <laughs> and like you say to yourself, who needs the clan? You're exterminating your own. The clan is not even needed. The clan is gonna sit back there and they're gonna laugh at you while you kill each other. They, 
some cops, some not all cops, not all cops, but some cops gonna laugh. They're gonna kill each other. What difference does it make anyway? They're animals anyway, so they're gonna kill each other. But uh, you know, let's show something different. Let's show let's show something better. You know, that's better not to do that stupid stuff than doing that stuff. You know, right. Oh, no, I definitely agree. And, uh, man, I, I just want to thank both of you, man. For me, it's a privilege. It's an honor that you will, you guys will come here, you know, like you mentioned. You, you, not, not financially compensated because I ain't got no money to give. So, <laughs> <laughs> But no, no, for real, it's, it's an honor. Like it's I, not I, a motive, you know? That's not a motive. No, no, yeah, yeah, no, no. But I, I, I believe in, in divine connections. Like when I met you that one day, it was just... You know, like when you, I said, man, I, I had to go, go Google your name, you, you know, because I knew the name, but, but not the face. And then. Now some guys going to Google your name when they say the, your platform, you know. Man, it, it, you know what, I, the way I look at it is God's platform, man, because I just want to like bring, bring a, share a message of hope, bring these testimonials. And what makes it easy for me is that it's really not about me. It's about the guy sitting in the chair right here. You know what I'm saying? It, it, I want to say it's an honor privilege for us to be here. You know, not 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 for you to have us here, but as you welcome uh, exactly. welcome us, so uh, you know, very hospitable. We appreciate that. You know, that's one thing I learned from my family, man. Hospitality for real. That when I when I started this, God placed that word in my heart. Hospitality, man. Open up your home, and that's why when I started with the workout in the word, inviting the guys just to work out, giving the word. Lot. No, no, yeah. But Fabian, my friend Fabian, yeah. Fabian Santiago. Uh, we went. To, we were going to New Orleans, and this man was so gracious to me that he gave me his bed, and he slept on the air mattress. You know, I don't forget that guy. I love that guy a lot. And so, you know, yeah, this is show right. me hospitality that I will never forget. You know? Yeah, no, yeah, it's very important. There's the little things that make a big difference, you know. But uh, man, if there if there's any nothing else you you guys want to share, man, if you guys, I always ask my guests if you guys could close us out in a prayer, so. You guys could take turns and we'll, 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 we'll wrap it up, man. I'll say a prayer. Yeah, go ahead. I, 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 I always say a prayer. Right. I'll just say, in, uh, we're praying in the name of Jesus that, you know, people's lives will change for the better to leave the mentality of hurting anybody alone and just prosper in your family and do good things in life. You know, it'll come back to you multi, multifold. And uh, I pray in Jesus' name that we could make a difference in, in helping somebody, you know, leave the path of destruction and the path of positivity. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen, amen. amen. Th th thanks for that, man. Thank you guys for your time. And with that, we're going to get ready to, 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 to wrap up. Uh, Matthew 4.16 reads, The people who sat in darkness have seen a great light, and upon those who sat in the region and the shadow of death, light has dawned. Alongside my guests, David Ayala and Jimmy Soto, my name is Omar Calvillo, and we are Wrong to Strong. Thank you.